G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and now I'd like to give Best Fiends a shout out for sponsoring this episode. So one of the things I love about true crime is that the further that you dig into a story, the more layers that you uncover. And that's part of what I love about the puzzle game Best Fiends too. The more I play, the more fun it gets. And quite honestly, Best Fiends is a great little game that features an array of puzzles with an engaging story and it's just a really good piece of entertainment for casual gameplay. I'm still playing it on my phone at night when I can't sleep, and I'm up to about level, I think 190 something now, and I've really enjoyed the fact that I don't have to invest huge amounts of time into the game to see progress and to have some fun. I also have really enjoyed the complexity in the levels as the challenge has ramped up a bit. And one of the better aspects of the game in my opinion are the boss levels where you have to really strategize for the win. But one of the strategies I've found really helpful too is combining explosives to knock out huge amounts of hit points. Oh, and uh, one other thing I only recently discovered too was that you don't need to worry about Wi-Fi access or using cell data to play, which is pretty sweet. Best Fiends has thousands of levels already with new levels, events, and characters added every month. It's hours of fun right at your fingertips, and as I mentioned, you can even play offline. With over 100 million downloads and tons of 5-star reviews, Best Fiends is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. I'm going to start by saying that this was a widely publicized case, so a few details will be changed. But I can assure you that the main part of this is definitely accurate. So a few years ago, I worked at a popular hooker lounge in my town. We had many regulars, so of course I got to know many of the people there, and made some lasting friendships with a few as well. Among those regulars was a group of people that I wasn't terribly fond of. Except for one girl, Rachel. Rachel was a kind girl who I would enjoy talking to. I just didn't approve of the people that she hung out with, or the decisions that she made. But it was her life, so what place did I have to say anything? Eventually, Rachel started dating another regular named Ben, who was a part of my friend group. This is when I got a lot closer, and she started trusting me and confiding in me. Eventually, Rachel and Ben broke up, and it devastated Rachel... I clearly remember her messaging me to hang out and her crying on my shoulder for about half an hour. During their relationship, Rachel stopped hanging around the shady people as much, but of course, afterwards, she went back to them and started partying a lot and doing who knows what. She stopped talking to me as much and eventually started dating some other guy in the shady group named Greg. Of course, that relationship went south, due to reasons unknown to me, but Rachel ended up filing for a restraining order against Greg. In a few days, I think anyway later, Rachel went missing and was actually never heard from again. It was truly awful as well. Her family started showing up to talk to me, asking if I'd seen her. I hadn't, but apparently someone told them that she was seen downtown somewhere. Honestly broke my heart as well. One day, during a busy shift, someone we both talked to sometimes showed up and talked to me about Rachel's disappearance. His name is P.O.S. P.O.S. told me that he'd heard about her being seen somewhere and wanted to know what I knew about it. He even asked me if I'd heard if anything had happened to her. I'm assuming that he thought since I worked at a regular hangout spot of hers that I would have heard something. I told him that I hadn't and that we hugged before he walked off to talk to other people. Months passed before I heard anything about Rachel. Her family showed up from time to time asking about her, but nothing changed. But around a year after her disappearance, the police had a breakthrough in her case, and her body was actually found. After some investigating, the police discovered that Greg had actually hired POS to kill Rachel, and he did. He hid her body and continued life as usual. But the fact that I spoke to P.O.S. after the fact, and even hugged him, just still weighs on my conscience. It's been years, and I'm still really upset about it. He's in prison, and I'll likely never see him again, but it definitely still hurts. I spoke to her family about her, having hugged the man who killed her. I wish that I had been a better friend to her, 
maybe I could have saved her. Who knows? Maybe I could have insisted that she didn't hang out with those people. I don't blame myself for a murder or anything, but I do wish that I could have done something. Had I had been a more insistent friend, then maybe she would still be here. Who knows? All I do know is that if for whatever reason I ever do see this guy again, it won't be a good thing for him. That's for sure. For background, my family moved to the countryside from the city when I was about seven years old, and I'm 21 now. Both my parents had grown up in the suburbs, and had also lived in the capital of our state for about 10 years before we moved. It definitely took us some time to get used to the train tracks that ran by our house, the wild animals, the weird but kind neighbors, and the odd visitors as well. Another thing, too, is that you have to get off the main road and turn onto a long gravel drive to get to our house. We can see the entire length of the driveway from certain points in our yard, which is about three acres. So, a few years after we moved in, my dad actually got a promotion at work, and as a result, started to go to conferences and business trips that lasted from a few days to a week at times, at least a couple of times a year. My mum felt nervous about being home alone with two young kids, I was 10 and my brother was 6, and so we decided to get a dog. We knew that we wanted a big dog, but something that would be gentle with my brother and I. After a few weeks of looking at shelters, we took home Rocky. He was 9 months when we took him home and already pushing 70 pounds. We believe he's a German Shepherd mixed with some sort of northern or mountain breed. We aren't sure to this day, but he's a massive red-colored dog with a long black muzzle and ears, a fluffy tail that he carries over his back, and a white stripe up his nose. It wasn't long, too, until he was a hundred pounds and an absolute force to be reckoned with. Even though he was very gentle with both my brother and I, loved our cats, and was a big ball of joy around anyone that we brought into our house... He tended to be very territorial and aggressive with other dogs, and very protective of us, especially of my mum and I. Once, the electric company came to do some work on the telephone poles on our property, without telling us first, and after 20 minutes, they finally had to call us because Rocky had them trapped in their truck, and was jumping up and barking at their windows. I doubt that he would have really attacked them if they had gotten out of their trucks, but it was more than enough to make them think twice. This protective instinct came in very, very handy one particular day. It was summertime, my dad was at work, and my mum was home with my brother and I, since she was a teacher and off for the summer with us. My mum was working in our garden, and my brother and I were just playing close by, with Rocky watching over all of us. Rocky all of a sudden sounded the alarm, throwing his head up in the air and barking and howling. He makes a sort of deep woo-woo noise, and I looked up to see a dirty white pickup truck pull off the main road and into our driveway. This wasn't necessarily alarming at first, as people sometimes use our driveway to turn around when they get lost. The white pickup slowly ambled up our driveway, and I could see something strange in the bed. It was lumpy and discolored, but I couldn't really tell what it was until he pulled all the way up into our house, where our other cars were, and honked the horn to get our attention. It was meat. Giant, red chunks of meat with some of the limbs of various animals still attached to it. It was uh, the creepiest thing that I've ever seen in my life. Just a, a grisly, scraggly man in his early 50s, driving a pickup truck full of meat in the southern July heat. I immediately just got a a really, really bad vibe from this guy, and I remember my mum telling my brother and I to go inside, and we did, but watched out the glass door. Rocky had surprisingly been quiet up to that point, but was now next to my mum, and she had her hand around his collar. The guy rolled down his window and asked my mum if she wanted to purchase some meat, but my mum said no, and to please leave our property. Instead, though, he went on about the different types of meat and asking how much we wanted beef, venison, pork, etc. My mom asked him to leave again, but instead, he decided to get out of his nasty white pickup. As soon as his feet were on the ground too, Rocky went absolutely ballistic, 
barking and snarling and carrying on. This finally made the guy stop. He looked at Rocky, looked at my mum, and asked, Oh, does your dog bite? And my mum, deathly serious, replied, Only if I tell him to. The guy took one more look at Rocky, and I'm guessing decided not to mess with the giant snarling beast. He got back in his truck, backed up, and headed back down our driveway. Now, I don't know if he was really selling the meat or not, but apparently he'd been around to our neighbours, who also had just gotten a really bad vibe from him. We'll never really know what he was really up to with those giant slabs of meat in the back of his pickup truck. Maybe he was just a weird guy trying to sell some sketchy meat. Maybe he was looking for something else. But we never saw Meat Man, as we started to call him, again though. Rocky is still kicking it, by the way. He's almost 15, actually, and completely deaf, but he's still out in the yard on summer days, always watching over all of us. This happened when I was about 11 years old. I lived in a typical North American suburb. I was out riding my bike and had some money in my pocket. My brother was at home and was actually a little sad that day, so when I heard the distant tune of Do Your Ears Hang Low, which was clearly from an ice cream truck, I sped on my bike to track it down and buy some ice cream to take to my brother. I finally caught up to it as well. The man in the ice cream truck looked different than the old man who we were used to in the neighborhood. He was early 20s, frizzy, Napoleon Dynamite-esque hair, before that movie came out, by the way. And oddly, this van had no markings. It was clean and looked like the same model as any other ice cream truck. Even had the loudspeaker on top, but even to my 11-year-old self, it was odd enough for me to be a little bit hesitant. I asked if he had the SpongeBob ice cream and the Gumball eyes, my brother's favorite, and he said that... He didn't know all the ice creams that he had in the back, but I could go and check. I hesitate for a moment, and he says, Look, man, I'm kind of in the middle of the road. I have to move. I'm going to turn up here, and you can climb in the back and pick an ice cream if you want. He pointed left down a street that was being developed, and there were only unoccupied in progress houses with dumpsters in front and construction equipment everywhere. I definitely didn't want to go with him down that cul-de-sac where no one could see us. So, in the end, I just ran. I dropped my bike. I still wonder why I didn't just jump back on the bike, but anyway, and I ran maybe a quarter mile home. I immediately told my mum and dad who were sitting on the porch what had happened. My mum calls the cops and my dad gets into his car to find that van. I chill in my room and I tell my brother my story. My dad actually finally found this guy as well at a neighboring pool parking lot where he was trying to lure two preteen girls into his van with the same tactic when a concerned citizen sitting in their car in the parking lot blocked the exit and also signaled a cop. In the end, I guess nothing came of it because when I try to Google my town and keywords that could have pertained to this incident, nothing ever really comes up. Sometimes I do wonder how things could have ended up. I mean, it could have simply been a dude trying to make some extra money on the side, but who was too lazy to get up and get the ice cream himself, sure. It could have been a dude who simply got thrills out of scaring kids, but it could have also been much worse than that. My family still thinks it's funny to hum the tune of Do Your Ears Hang Low when I'm around. I find it humorous, I must admit, but still... It was a, a bit of a scary moment, and something that I don't think I'll ever forget. Growing up in the 90s, my mum was always very protective towards my sister and me. Most of the time it seemed to us like just overkill, like we were sheltered girls. But there was one incident from my childhood that makes me glad that my mum never dropped a guard, even once. So I was a preteen, probably 10 or 11 years old. My mum and I had finished doing some shopping at Sam's Club and we'd stopped at a Wendy's for an early dinner. To my eyes, nothing unusual had happened. We stood in line and ordered, we ate and then we left. We were walking in the parking lot and almost had made it back to the minivan when my mum said, sort of loudly, that she should probably go to the bathroom before driving home. 
remember thinking that that was a bit weird because well, we weren't that far away. I was just old enough too that sometimes if my mum had to run into a store briefly, like less than five minutes, she would give me the keys and let me sit in the locked van and just read. The back windows were tinted so it was hard to see if someone was inside but she would always rush through her business and come jogging back to the van to minimize the time that she had left me alone. So I just asked her if I could have the keys and she said no. She thought that I ought to try to use the bathroom too. I remember telling her that I didn't have to go and through gritted teeth she told me to try anyway. On our way back into the restaurant we passed a middle-aged man. He was a bit dirty looking as if he'd spent all day welding or working on cars perhaps. He was of an average height and thin and had longish grey hair. Nothing about him was remarkable to me and he only made brief eye contact with us as we turned around. He was heading to a pickup truck parked in the front of the lot while we were parked more towards the left side of the building. When we got back inside, my mum didn't head towards the bathroom though but instead led us to a table where we sat down. Uh, mum, are we going to the bathroom? I asked. No, my mum said. But we're waiting here until that man leaves, that one over there. She was talking about the man that had walked behind us, heading to the red pickup truck. Aside from the grime, he didn't seem too weird to me, so I thought that my mum was making a snap judgment. Why? I asked. I kept catching him staring at us in line, she explained. He would look at you and look away and look back and then he left right after we did. It just didn't feel right, okay? And I'd rather be safe than sorry. I told her that I didn't see anything and asked if I could get a frosty while we waited. My mum was looking down into her wallet to see if she had the cash for my ice cream when that red pickup truck rolled by the front window, impossibly slow. The man in the driver's seat was turned so his shoulders were almost square with the restaurant as he passed, looking in. His eyes sought us out inside and found me. I will never forget the full bore of his eyes as he stared at me for the whole length of his passing the window before accelerating to normal speed and driving away. I'm 33 now and I still get chills when I think about that day. The man's stare and, in particular, the way my mum checked her mirrors for a red pickup truck the whole ride home. I've been doing my one hour of outdoor exercise at night because I find it most relaxing. My neighbourhood is really quiet and I'm actually pretty lucky to live in a nice area which I've always considered super safe. I used to walk at night, even before lockdown, because I live right next to a canal, so there's lots of nice paths that are super pretty at night when everything is all lit up by the moon. But anyway, I was walking last night, and I decided to go to the shop first because I was hungry, and then detour back to my usual route along the canal. When I was walking, I heard two guys speaking super loudly in German. I live in England, so it was a bit unusual, but not anything that I thought twice about. They looked around 30, pretty tall, and they had caps on which I remember because they had matching designs, which I thought was pretty funny. They started getting really close, and when I glanced back to look at them, they started jeering, so I knew that they were looking at me, which kind of freaked me out, so I sped walk towards the shop, but had to stop at the road. I wasn't planning on getting hit by a car. They caught up to me, though, but didn't stop for the lights to change, so walked across and went into the store that I was headed for. So I shrugged off my hunger and decided to just go for the canal for my walk. I stopped thinking about the men soon after though, just chalking it up to me being a generally anxious person. I don't particularly like walking past strangers at night, and I'm self-conscious enough as it is without them talking to or about me. But anyway, I complete my walk and I'm headed back home. For the story to make sense too, I sort of need to describe where I was stood. So on my right is the water itself. I'm stood on the path and to my left there's a big drop that goes straight onto the main road. Next to that road there's a row of houses and there's a railway bridge in front of me too. I have my earphones in and my music is pretty loud but I think that I hear someone shouting so I take one earphone out and I listen but 
it's pretty silent, apart from passing cars on the road below me. But that's when I see two men heading towards the bridge, and I immediately recognize them as the two guys who had jeered at me before from their caps. I stop walking as my anxiety floods back and consider phoning somebody because I irrationally think that if I'm on the phone when they walk past me that they won't bother me. But despite the fact that I've been stood frozen for ages, nobody comes out from under the bridge. I wait, staring at the bridge for a while in complete confusion because there's no way they could have just vanished like that. I can see through to the other side of the bridge, so I knew that they didn't turn around and walk away or anything, but they certainly hadn't walked through because no one had passed me. After a few moments, I start to think that... Maybe I just hallucinated them or something? I have no history of hallucinations though, but I couldn't explain it any other way. So I start slowly walking towards the mouth of the bridge, and just as I'm about to step in, I see it. The shadow of one of the men cast across the wall. My blood literally ran cold as I realized what was going on. They were waiting for me at the other side of the bridge, but... They must have been hiding behind something so I wouldn't see them. My mind went to a million different places panicking about what they would do if I walked under that bridge. I was convinced that they would just follow me. If I stayed where I was and phoned for help, I was certain that they would come out and see what was going on and I'd be trapped. So I did the only thing that I could think to do. I quietly ran to the fence that separated the canal path from the drop to the main road and climbed it. It was about thigh height and on the other side there was a small space where the wall and the drop itself was. I waited for a couple of moments as the cars passed but thankfully I live in a quiet area so the road was soon empty. I managed to navigate myself so that I could lower myself off of the drop without A. making much noise or B. hurting myself too much. And the moment that my feet hit the road I raced to the side where the houses were and sped walk down that path as fast as I could without making noise, only glancing back when I was nearing the end of the road. The men were still there next to the bridge. I could see that they were looking through the bridge to see where I'd gotten to, and quite honestly, I felt sick and terrified, but eventually I made it home safely. I don't know what they wanted. I don't know why they were there, and... I don't know who they were or if they'll be there again tonight, but what I do know is that I'm not going to be walking at night for a very long time. When I was a kid, probably eight or ten years old, I used to see shadow people in the night. It happened almost every single night, in fact. It was so frequent that I just sort of got used to them. They never scared me when I saw them. They just sort of walked against the wall and watched me while I was in bed. I remember that they never had clothes, just a figure of a body with a bald head. They used to open my door at night, and I'm pretty sure that one even whispered my name into my ear one night before bed while I was brushing my teeth. I was in the washroom with my cousin and sister brushing our teeth before bed. They finished before me, and I was alone upstairs. I could feel something behind me too, but didn't acknowledge it until I heard a really faint whisper of someone saying my name right into my ear. All I remember is freaking out and running downstairs screaming that someone just said my name. There was also this one time when I was playing hide and seek with three of my siblings, and after finding two of them, we were looking for my sister, and toys started getting flung out of her room. Being kids, we just sort of laughed it off, went running into the room looking for her, but there wasn't anyone in there and we ended up finding her hiding in the basement. I also remember that I used to suffer from two different night terrors when we lived in that house. One of them I still can't explain to this day. I can only draw a picture, but it's hard for me to do because of how traumatizing it was. But the other was a dream of me walking down my basement and finding a little girl curled up in a ball in a box crying. The strange thing about that second dream is that my younger brother had the exact same dream the whole time that we were there. I'm 23 now and he's 17 and we both agree that there was some messed up stuff going on in that house, for sure.
four years ago when I was 17. I'm also female. My best friend Hannah, also 17, came over to my house for the weekend. I believe that it was a Saturday night when it happened, but we stayed up late, made some junk food, watched some movies, etc. It was around 1am when I decided to take a shower and head to bed. After our horror movie marathon, I was pretty paranoid, so I asked Hannah to sit in the bathroom with me while I showered, so she did just that. She sat on the toilet and played some music on her cell phone, and we talked about whatever we had going on in our lives while I was showering. Finally, after about maybe 20 minutes of showering, I got out and I grabbed my towel. Hannah was still sitting on the toilet, and she said my name, so I turned to face her, and... That's when I noticed some movement in the bathroom window above her head. The window kind of distorted it slightly, but I immediately knew what I was looking at. It was a face, a man's face, smirking at me from the other side of the glass. The man immediately ducked out of view and I quickly faced away, wrapping my towel around me. I whispered to Hannah that there was a man looking in the window and she laughed, thinking that I was messing with her. So, she bravely stands up and, to her horror, becomes face to face with this creep, staring and smirking at us. We run out of the bathroom and wake my parents, but the creepy dude is already gone by the time that my dad gets outside, and he better be glad for that. The next day, my parents investigate outside the window, and sure enough, there was a cinder block underneath it that the man had been standing on indicating that this probably wasn't the first time that he's peeped on me. And stuffed between the block and the wall was a bag of lotion. The window cling was pretty much useless too, as you could see everything inside the bathroom clearly from the outside, but but we didn't know that at the time. And to this day too, I still can't shower without having the bathroom windows covered up. I work second shift at my company, normally from 5pm to 1am. On the street that I work, there are two ways for me to get home. To the left takes me over some train tracks. There's a 24 hour burger place and a Mexican fast food place that's open till about 3am. The police station is maybe 10 minute drives from the tracks too, and to the right it takes me straight to the highway which gets me home. If I go to the left, I have to take side streets to get to the highway as it doesn't connect for a few blocks, or go back over the tracks and past my workplace to get to the highway. I hope I didn't lose you there, but this is important. So, tonight I got out a bit early, about 12.30. Lucky me, right? I was hungry, so instead of going straight home, I decided to go for some burgers. Usually I have my window rolled down, listening to music on my phone, As I closed my car door, I realized a rather large spider, okay, it was the size of my thumb but it's still a big spider to me, has spun its web outside between my window and my side mirror. Spiders, they really freak me out, and if it had been inside, I would have beaten Usain Bolt getting out of that car, let me tell you. Since it was outside though, I contented myself to leave my windows rolled up and just blast my music. As I'm pulling out, I see the train barriers coming down. I'm not foolish enough to try and beat it, so I pull up and I wait for the barrier. As I'm waiting, I see movement out of the corner of my eye, and that was when I see him. A haggard man, maybe somewhere in his 30s with dirty hair and clothes, standing right next to my car. We have a few homeless people around here, but they usually don't bother you if you just ignore them and don't talk to them. And I figured that he would go away eventually, but no. He walks to the driver's side and tries to open my car door. My car has automatic locks that activate pretty much as soon as you turn the car on, thank goodness. But he then starts banging on my car door window. He keeps screaming to let him in and I reach for my phone, but of course I'm panicking and I can't get it out of my purse and then immediately drop it down the side of my seat. I'm scared that he's going to break the glass or something at this point. I have a foldable nightstick in my car, but in my panic, I forgot that it was there. I finally get a hold of my phone and dial 911. I'm screaming at him to back off and that I've called the police. He's going around trying to get in my car via the other doors, screaming at me the whole time, calling me about every name in the book, saying get out of the car. 
I'm giving the dispatcher my location and it feels like forever for the cops to show up, but was likely only a few minutes. The guy in the meantime is crawling on top of my car and beating it with his fists. Of course, now the train has left and the barrier is up, but I don't want to risk killing this guy by flooring it over the tracks. I mean, I'm pretty sure that that would be at least a manslaughter charge if he dies. I'm not sure about that, but I wasn't willing to take the risk of any jail time over this crazy person. Thankfully, I see the cop lights coming and he runs off and one of the responding officers gives chase. The other cop tells me to pull in at the burger place and calms me down. He takes all the information that I can remember in my panic state. He then says offhandedly something to the effect of, good thing your windows weren't down. And that was when it hit me. The only reason they weren't down was because of that spider on my car. They didn't find the guy either, as there's a crap ton of places to hide around here, and it's pretty rough terrain at night, but they did say that they would step up patrols around the area. But the cops assured me that I did everything right that I could have done, didn't get out of the car and called for help and all that, and after that I decided to just skip eating out, as I just wasn't in the mood anymore, and just went home to have a freak out and methodically quadruple check all my doors and windows. The cops also said that they would call if they found anything, so we'll see, I guess. I don't know what his deal was, but it was a pretty terrifying situation. And these days, I don't mind spiders so much anymore. When I was a kid, I lived in the deep forest in northern Canada. But for a few years, we lived in a very big, very old house, more than two hours from the nearest town. The house was built right next to an old indigenous graveyard. I'm talking at most 20 feet from the front door, in fact. I spent many hours playing on the land around our house and even sitting at the edge of the graveyard wondering about it, but I never actually stepped a foot inside of it. There was a river running by the house that a young girl drowned in many years prior. The house wasn't lived in for a long time before us, but it was occasionally used by hunters. But we were very remote, we didn't have power or running water and the nearest neighbours were just miles away. Now, my dad was raising cattle and often out in the barn or about a 45 minute drive away at his parents' neighbouring ranch. But one day he was in the barn and the door swung shut and locked him in there from the outside. He hollered for about 20 minutes figuring someone had drove up and was messing with him. When suddenly the door was unlocked and there was just nobody there nobody driving away and nothing. The first time we heard the chanting too was shortly after that incident. My mum and I were inside cooking dinner on the wood stove. It was completely dark outside so it must have been winter when all of a sudden, clear as day, we hear indigenous chanting coming from outside. But since my mum was still a little spooked by the barn incident, she figured that it was my stepdad messing with her and sort of tried laughing it off. Not even five minutes later, he comes over the radio from his parents' ranch, 45 minutes away, saying that he was running late for dinner. It happened a number of times too, and I remember just laying awake in my mum's bed with her, just listening. There were no other sounds around us as well, and it was unmistakable. My baby brother moved out of his room into their room as well, because his door just kept slamming shut without any explanation, and stopped once he stopped sleeping in there. There was a lone wolf that wandered around our property at night. It never harmed us or any animals, but we saw it in the dark a few times and there were always tracks as well. I remember dreaming of the same lady over and over again. She had long braids with a dandelion behind her ear, always wearing a red dress. I told my aunt that I was seeing her for real, but it was always in the middle of the night, so I can't be too sure if I was just dreaming or not. I went hysterical one night though apparently, crying to my mum because I was scared to die, completely out of the blue. I was a kid when these things happened so I'm not super clear on all the details but I always wondered if it was them and if they were upset with us or something. Eventually though we moved away and life moves on and we have a cool story that nobody believes. But then... Just under 20 years later in a new town in a different province, I'm sitting in a Reiki session for my daughter for the first time and halfway through, the therapist looks at me and says that she senses a strong indigenous spiritual presence around me. It's such a strong feeling in fact that she has to say something. She says that she can feel that I was accepted by these things as a young child and now, 
they're my guardians or something. So I guess in the end I got my answer. They were never angry to begin with. For me, anyways. So I have a story that I experienced as a four-year-old boy that I need to get off my chest. I lived in a third world country in South America. My young parents moved into a new apartment. The owners had mental problems, both the mother and her son. And I don't remember them much, but from the stories I've heard, they were pretty scary people. Had a dark aura to them or something. Anyways, I remember seeing these mannequin looking things move around the house while my parents were sleeping. And every night, I would see the same thing but they would hide in the washroom and in our living room and pretty much everywhere. But there were at least 10 to 20 approximately. They looked human, but with no emotions, and their skin looked almost fake and pale, like plastic. My parents tell me, although I don't remember this, when we passed by normal stores with mannequins that I would start crying and they would be confused and didn't know why I was crying. I don't think my parents could see them at night, and they seemed to have a ghostly form and a physical form almost. Either way though, it was hell just about every night seeing these things watching me from outside my parents' room. I sometimes slept beside them at that age. I also had a small crib because I was a very hyperactive child. I could hear them moving stuff around and I remember seeing their emotionless faces. I could not go to the bathroom alone without my dad too because I was petrified. And then one day, while I was sleeping, I felt like I was just picked up and quickly woke up and it was the mannequins, two of them. But they tried to take me away but they dropped me on the floor and quickly left. Something must have startled them because I have no idea why they let me go. When my parents woke up and quickly found me in the middle of the room on the floor, they had no idea what or who moved me. And it was only later on that I told them what happened when I was a teenager. Now, to give a bit more detail on their appearance, they had plastic looking arms, they were pale, no hair on most of them or any facial expressions, they were average height, skinny to average weight, but not as skinny as mannequins, but dead eyes that I remember and will never forget, had a, an androgynous look to them almost, but the aura was the most horrific thing that I've ever felt to this day. So I need to share this somewhere and I don't know really what I'm after but I just think I want to know that I'm not crazy. My sister, 17 and female and I, 20 female, were on holiday with our parents to the Bahamas. We stayed in this beautiful beachfront house with a fair bit of land surrounding it. On this stretch of beach there were about two other houses and it was maybe a kilometre with no other house about. My sister and I shared a room off the main living room with an ensuite. I had the double bed against one wall and my sister was sleeping on the lower bed of a bunk bed opposite to me in the corner. My parents were sharing another room off the main living room on the other side. And one night I woke up suddenly to the sound of someone laughing. It was like a woman's voice but laughing sort of like a jack in the box. Nothing like I'd ever heard before and it didn't even really sound human. It filled the entire room and I couldn't tell where it was coming from lasted about five seconds and I laid there absolutely frozen in bed until it stopped. Then my sister said, did you hear that? In a shaken voice? And I whispered back yes and she asked if it was me. I said no, obviously. And we both just laid there awake and in silence until the morning when my dad came in at 6am to ask if we wanted to watch the sunrise. But we immediately told him everything and he just didn't give a crap thinking that we were imagining stuff or something. Although I'd like to think that we were well past the age of imagining things, especially since we both heard the same thing. But we both have no idea what time this happened. I guess that it was about 3am judging by how long we laid in silence, but there isn't really any way to tell. I didn't check my phone as I was just too scared to move. Talking to my sister after, she said that she was awake before the laughing started and that the room just started rumbling like as if a train was going past, it was shaking. The rumbling and the shaking intensified and then the laughing started and then I woke up and then it all just stopped suddenly. It couldn't have been any of us sleep talking as we both heard it and 
we were both awake and nothing could possibly explain the noise. We both couldn't figure out where it was coming from too. If I had to place it, I thought it was on my sister's end of the room and she thought that it was on mine. But we also can't compare it to anything like we've heard before, which is really strange. I don't know if anyone has an explanation or theory for this, even if they aren't exactly going to give me a piece of their mind. If I'm being honest too, it's kind of infuriating as my parents tease us about it all the time and we are deadly serious that this is inexplainable and it happened. If it helps too, this isn't the first time my sister and I have experienced apparent and inexplicable paranormal activity while sharing a room away from home. This incident that I'm sharing happened in October of 2018. I'm going to try my best to keep this as short as possible and try not to include useless details, but there's a lot to this entire story, so hang tight. My first semester of college was in the fall of 2018. I met this guy, Ron, through a friend of mine and he seemed pretty cool. I also thought that he was cute, but I'd heard from other people around me that he had a girlfriend, so I wasn't flirting with him despite the initial attraction. I got put in a group chat with Ron and a couple of other people, and me and I started texting on occasion. Fast forward a few weeks though, and I'm walking back to my dorm from an event that my university hosted. It was around 10.30 at night. I'd been passively texting Ron that night because he missed the event and wanted to know what was going on, and I made a comment about how I wanted orange juice for some reason, probably because I always crave OJ, after 9pm anyway. I got back to my building, and... He was standing outside of it. Now, I'd never told him where I lived, but the girl he was supposedly dating lived in a building connected to mine, so I didn't question it. I talked to him for a second and then walked up to my room where I had a window. And he was still standing outside and I got a text from him saying that he was going to buy me some orange juice. So I opened the window and said it was a nice offer but unnecessary. In response, he said something along the lines of, I want to flirt with you, am I allowed to do that? I asked what he meant and he said, well, you're cute, I want to flirt with you, not in a weird way but like in an encouraging way, like a gay best friend or something. And I said, uh, sure? He asked if I could come down to talk and since I was apparently stupid and naive, I did. And then he asked if we could go inside. I'd had male friends in my room before and for some reason I didn't see any red flags with Ron so I said okay. We talked about multiple things and all was normal at first but things soon got pretty weird. You see Ron was sitting at my desk and out of his blue eyes just rolled into the back of his head and then his voice changed like his accent changed from a regular American accent to Russian I think. And then he started saying scary stuff like how he was trying to figure out what mask to put on around me and that he never talks in his real voice. He would also chuckle out of nowhere and then said that he was anti-Semitic and racist and hated everyone. He explained that being my gay best friend would mean that he would give me encouragement if I needed it, whether it's emotional or physical. He said, and I'll give you hugs but not in an affectionate way, like this is affectionate. And he proceeded to wrap his arms around me in an iron grip and stare at me, unblinking. I said, okay, you can let me go. And when I moved, he didn't budge. So I said, dude, that's enough, stop. And he finally let go of me after I told him multiple times. But before he left my room, he said that he was in fact dating the girl that I'd mentioned, but that he would be hitting on me if he was single. He said that screwing friends isn't okay, but that he would screw me if I really needed it, because he apparently found me attractive. He also admitted that he had lied to a lot of people about his lineage. He told everyone that he was Slavic, but he grew up in my home state. He also had three different IDs in his wallet, all with different names. He would sometimes switch back to talking about normal stuff, like how he loves his girlfriend and classes, and then he would just switch back to that weird thing. On the way out of my room, once I stressed that he needed to leave, he said, Hey, uh, do you want to know how bad the locks are on your door? I said no, 
He then asked if he was attractive and genuinely intimidated at this point. I said, yeah. I know it's dumb, but I thought that if I said otherwise that he'd get angry and just go ballistic. I got him to leave and I closed the door. I looked at the people to watch him leave, but he stood outside of my door just staring at it for a good five to ten seconds. I soon texted him and told him not to flirt with me because it made me uncomfortable, and he said, thanks for letting me know. So I figured I was in the clear at this point. After this, he started calling me multiple times each day at odd hours, like 3 in the morning. He started showing up in a lot of the same places that I frequented. I started avoiding him because it was beginning to freak me out. I confided in Shane, the friend that introduced me to Ron about what had happened and what had been going on. Once I told Shane about what was happening and about the things that Ron had said to me, he began to notice just how much Ron would appear wherever I was. Shane noticed him lurking outside of the entrance to our building that was closest to my room, the one on the back side of the building. He also noticed that Ron would stare me down in public settings and that he would move when he was sitting to be nearer to where I was. One day, Shane and I were sitting outside too and Ron just started skating circles around me on his longboard, staring at me. The loop that he was taking was one of the bumpiest roads on the campus too and... Shane said that he was staring at me the whole time. Shane saw Ron eventually right around the side of the building where the backside entrance was and hide around the corner. It was at this point too that Shane told me that I needed to report what was happening to my RA, but I honestly thought that I was overreacting to it all. Shane disagreed, but the weeks went on as normal. I slowly stopped seeing Ron around as much though, and I soon found out that Shane had gone to my RA himself and said what was going on, keeping my name out of it. My RA looked horrified and banned Ron from entering my building. I blocked his number to stop the 3am phone calls, and I eventually stopped seeing him around campus altogether. I know the ending is a bit anticlimactic, but everything leading up to Shane taking action was very peculiar and scary. I was worried Ron would break into my room or worried that he would try to grab me one day and worried about several other things that he said to me that I didn't detail in this story since they're all hard to discuss. Anyway, in the end there was definitely something wrong with Ron but I hope that I never see him again. This is going to kind of be long but hopefully it'll be interesting to somebody at least. I hate how much paranormal stuff is often faked. It takes all credibility away from the study of it. There are real things though that are unexplainable that I wish would be taken more seriously by science. And since I have first-hand accounts of something unexplainable, I feel I should at least share what I've experienced. I guess that I just think the more true information out there, the better. So some of this kind of gets a little, well, I guess I would say bigger than I ever expected. I'm agnostic and not very superstitious. I believe in ghosts, but I'm always questioning everything. Trust me, I don't blame anybody for not believing in this. But just a warning, some of this is going to sound, well, for a lack of a better term, made up. But I can assure you that it's 100% the truth. And this is the only paranormal stuff that's ever happened to me. Nothing before and nothing ever since. Okay... So senior year of high school, my friend and I got a Ouija board from Toys R Us. It was almost Halloween and we wanted to do something kind of creepy. We used it a few times and it worked on and off. Sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't. But when it would work, it would answer questions like knowing our family members' names and stuff like that. But we thought it was pretty cool, but I now realize that it could have just been our subconscious moving it or something. I don't trust any answer if a person on the board knows the answer as well. I mean, I've seen a scientific study on it, and it is totally a thing. A little detour as well, but basically a group of people in the study used a Ouija board, and it was answering questions and working great. They then blindfolded everyone, and all the Ouija board spelt was absolute nonsense. While I do believe the board answers on its own, I think that some answers can sometimes be filled in by someone's subconscious, if there isn't a good connection. But anyway, we thought it was cool still, and we told our friends. One of our friends wanted to try it in a cemetery, and we were down. So, a few nights later, around 11 or midnight, the three of us went to a cemetery. 
As we used it, it seemed as though there were little noises like rustling and little twigs snapping just all around us. We'd take little breaks from it and the noises would stop, but once we put our hands back on, the sounds would start up again. The sounds may have very well been just coincidental, but we were creeped out nonetheless. At one point, when I looked in the direction of a sound, I could have sworn too that I saw a dark figure, about four feet tall, dart behind a tombstone in the distance. It was dark, so I really don't know, but I was creeped out and my eyes may have been playing tricks on me. Who knows? We then left the cemetery and headed to a park next to an orchard. But we started using it again and we're hearing the same kind of noises though. This was a long time ago, but I'm pretty sure there was a sound of something running towards us from the orchard as well. I kind of remember it, but my friend remembers it really well apparently. But we kept talking to it though, and all of a sudden it started answering every question with just fire. And no matter what we asked, it was always fire. We were asking, are you talking about hell? Did you die in fire? Am I going to die in fire? But still, all it would say is fire. I think it just kind of stopped working after that and it started spelling nonsense and moving really slow. So we then just packed up and we headed home. Now, I dropped off one of my friends at his house and was driving to my other friend's house to drop him off as well. And I know that this is going to sound a little bit unbelievable, but in the distance, way down the road, we saw a light. We didn't know what it was, but as I drove closer, we realized that... It was a car on fire, parked on the side of the road, and we could hardly believe it. It was just sitting there in flames, and I still ask him to this day, that really happened, right? It was in the local newspaper the next week as well, and it said that there were no signs of theft and that it was probably vandalism. I'm not going to say that the Ouija board definitely did it. It might have just been telling us that it happened. I don't know, but it was weird nonetheless. So anyways, we were in shock and I decided to hang with him a bit when we got to his house. We went upstairs to his room and we talked about it. At some point he went to the bathroom and when he came back, he closed the door to his bedroom and as he took one step away, there was a single bang on the door. He opened the door and nothing was there. We talked for a minute about this but then started hearing clearly heavy steps walking up and down the hall outside of his room. We listened for a bit and then we opened the door and as we looked out, his mum was looking out of her bedroom too. She said that she had heard the same thing and I stayed for a while longer and then I just headed home. I eventually get home and maybe 20 minutes later, my friend calls in a panic and says that he felt a breath on the back of his neck. I wasn't there so I don't know but he seemed pretty legitimately terrified. I basically stayed on the phone with him until sunlight as well. Now, I'm not too sure how much later this next part happened. It was within the month, but another one of our friends really wanted to try the board. He couldn't believe everything we were saying, so we went out with him one night to the same park but a different area. It was a picnic table up on a hill. It was next to a waist-high fence blocking a 30-foot drop down to the orchard, and it immediately started working as soon as we touched it. We talked to it for a while. I don't really remember exactly what it was saying. Our friend was pretty shocked but still not convinced. And he then asked it to make a noise. I hate how cliche this is going to sound but probably about 10 seconds after he asked, there was the sound of a little girl giggling in the orchard. It was a high pitched little giggle that went for maybe 2 seconds. But we all heard it clear as day as well and none of us could believe it. Our friend kept saying, there's no way, there's just no way. We started to talk to it again and he asked it to make another noise. Pretty soon after that, there was a slow cracking sound coming from the orchard. It was basically the sound of a large branch slowly cracking and falling off of a tree. We could also hear the other tiny branches and leaves rustling around it as it fell. I don't remember if we heard the thud of it landing though, but it was super clear though and we were definitely in shock. I mean, it was pretty much unbelievable that this was happening. We talked about it for a bit and then our friend asked it to make another noise. At this time, there was a single high-pitched little beep on the other side of us. 
It was only half a second, but it was super loud and we definitely all heard it. I think it just stopped working after a while, so we eventually just packed it up and we left. And this part pisses me off. I haven't talked to our friend who was there in years, but somebody I know said that they had recently talked to him about it. He remembers all of it, but he won't even consider the chance of it being possibly paranormal. He thinks that it's all just coincidences. Anyway, another one of our friends still wasn't believing us. We used it one time in the park with him and someone else too, but it wasn't that great. It just wasn't very responsive or something those two times. We asked it to make a noise and nothing happened and it just wasn't happening so eventually we gave up. But then, maybe a few weeks later, we went up to this guy's cabin with some friends to get drunk. A few friends had supposedly seen a shadow figure there so we thought, hey, why not, let's bring the Ouija board out. We get super drunk and then we pull it out. One of our friends who doesn't believe it gets on the board. He started asking it some questions about family names and stuff like that. It's answering some correctly and others are just nonsense. He's completely wasted at this point. He starts calling it every bad word you can think of. He's just being an idiot basically and trying to be funny. He keeps cussing at it and putting it down. He kept yelling, prove you're real, do something, prove it you pussy. He kept going like this for a while too and then he just packed it up and kept getting drunk and smoking cigarettes. Nothing really happened for the rest of the time that we were at the cabin as well. We might have used it in the morning or something. I don't really remember, but we drove back the next day and when I got to my house, I went to my room and got to my computer. I was hooked on MySpace back then and my friend who was yelling at the Ouija board and I actually had a little band page on MySpace. I clicked on her page and the profile views had somehow changed to 666. For anybody who didn't have MySpace, MySpace would keep track of profile views and show a counter on your public profile and on your homepage as well. I logged into the band account and on the homepage, there were still 800 something views like normal. I looked at the profile again and there was still 666. No matter how many times I or anybody clicked on the page as well, it would stay at 666. In fact, it stayed like that for two weeks and then all of a sudden, one day it just went back to normal. There's still comments on the profile where people are talking about it. Everybody was a little bit creeped out by it. But after that, we didn't use the board for a few years. We let somebody borrow it at some stage and then we just stopped hanging out with them, so we just never got it back. We didn't really care though, I mean, we just didn't feel like using it anymore after all of these experiences anyway. Now, a few years later, I was sharing a house with my friend and it was almost Halloween and we had some friends over. We were all getting drunk and talking about our Ouija board experiences. We were talking about how we should have gotten the board back. I told them how my mum used to make her own when she was a kid and that you can make them out of literally nothing. My mum always told me too to never use a Ouija board. She had some bad experiences when she was a kid and knew that it was very real and very dangerous. And honestly, these stories and warnings only made me want to use it more. So, a quick story about her as well that's pretty crazy. She and her sister were using it at her aunt and uncle's place. There was a phone call, so her aunt left the room to go and answer the phone. My mom asked the board who's on the phone and it started moving to a bunch of just different numbers. Her aunt hangs up and comes back into the room. Her uncle asked who was on the phone. I don't remember exactly what it was, but basically there was a mix-up with someone's flight. She maybe said something about the flight number and some other numbers. And long story short, all the numbers matched up with the board. Her uncle, who was also very religious, didn't like that. Up until then, he had only thought it was a little trick or a game. He began asking it questions and mentioning God, and the board began saying vulgar things to them. He grabbed the Bible and started reading scripture to it. I don't know how long this went on, but the board ended up telling him that it was going to kill him. They asked how, and it responded, car. I think it was two weeks later, too, that he was driving somewhere and got into a really bad car accident that left him in a critical condition. Some older women in my family, like my mum's grandma or her great aunt or something, told my mum once that she sent something with her and she said that my mum was like her and had a gift. But my mum has said that she sometimes gets weird feelings like someone's there, but nothing too crazy. 
She's not seeing and hearing ghosts all the time or anything like that. I was thinking if maybe this is possibly why my Ouija board experiences were as crazy as they were. Again, I don't know, but it's a hypothesis. I'm definitely not thinking I'm psychic or anything. I've never felt anything like that. All I'm saying is that maybe I just inherited enough of it to make the Ouija board do crazy things. I don't know. Maybe none of that is real, but it's just something I was told. I have no idea. It all sounds a bit crazy to me, and I feel a bit embarrassed even saying it. But anyway, back to the story now. So me and my friends were all drunk at our house. I made a Ouija board out of a 30-pack box and a shot glass. My two friends started using the board, but it was hardly working. I then sat down to give it a try, and as soon as we asked it a question, it worked. It was moving at a decent speed, and I used it for a bit, and then my friend swapped in. The board was still working for them, and it told them its name was Agatha. It kept working for the next half hour or so as well, and then we stopped. We used it one more night after that with somebody else, and it worked again. I don't remember anything interesting happening that night, but some time passes, and me and my friend are sitting on the couch one day. We're watching TV, and we start hearing those heavy footsteps again from upstairs. We just sat there, terrified, as we listened. And they were just walking up and down the hall for some reason and they stopped and we went and looked but nothing was there. Another time we were sitting on the back deck. There was a door about 20 feet from the chairs. It led to this little side room and all of a sudden there were several quick knocks coming from that door. Again we just froze and stared in shock. I had crazy goosebumps at that point and my eyes were watering and I wasn't about to cry but that's just for some reason my natural ghost reaction. Even sometimes if I'm just hearing a ghost story from a co-worker or a friend that I trust, I get goosebumps. I don't know why, I, I don't think it's an energy thing or anything like that. I've never felt the electrical energy that they describe, I think I'm just creeped out by it all, a lot. And for some reason it only happens with the paranormal. I don't know, but it's just a different kind of fear or something. Anyways... Another time we had a few other people over and we were all drinking down in the basement. There was a flimsy metal door that led outside, the kind that lifts up from the ground. We were drinking and listening to music when all of a sudden something started banging really loudly on the metal door. It probably banged about four or five quick times. We all froze and looked at each other and we turned off the music. I walked up the stairs and pushed open the metal door and nobody was there. We obviously looked around, but there was nothing there. We lived way out in the country, so we kind of already knew what it was, right when it happened. But a few weeks later, I was sitting in my room, and there was an empty cereal bowl sitting in front of me on my desk. I was looking at my laptop, and in the corner of my eye, I saw the handle of the spoon lift up about a centimeter, and then flick two inches along the side of the bowl. It was a ceramic bowl, so it made the little click sound, and I definitely heard that. Another time one night, I was at my parents' house. My roommate and I were in a band, and a lot of my recording stuff, like my computer, was still there. I was working on something, and all of a sudden, I heard a cat start yowling. It sounded exactly like one of our old cats, and it was really slow and drawn out. But the weird thing is that it sounded like it was coming from our attic. I walk into my closet where I have a little push-up opening onto the ceiling where you can get into the attic. I would blow smoke up into it when I was smoking weed in my room so it was already open and the yowling didn't stop. I stared up at the hole and it sounded like the cat was right up there above me. I called the cat's name a few times because I didn't think it was anything weird. I just thought our cat somehow got trapped in the attic when all of a sudden the yowl just started to change. It slowly started morphing into a voice of a, an old woman. With each yowl it slowly started sounding more and more like help me. It was at the same exact pace as the yowls, same pitch and everything and it just took on a human voice. It was weird and really creepy living it. I just kind of stared up at the noise and... I was definitely freaked out, but I almost didn't believe it at the same time. And eventually, I just walked away and closed the closet door, and I sat down at my desk and basically just tried to pretend that it never happened. 
I was definitely scared, but I didn't want to show it. My friend and I continued to hear footsteps and other forms of movement too, on and off throughout our time at that house. And the only time that I ever definitely saw something was at that house. So, I was the only one home and I was recording something on piano. I was sitting, staring forward, listening to the playback. When very quickly, a shadow of a person darted across the wall right in front of me. It's hard to explain, but it was the exact same way the shadow would have looked if my roommate were to have run up the stairs. I knew it was around the time that he'd be getting home, so I thought nothing of it and thought it must have been him. I took off my headphones and walked into the living room, and I didn't hear my roommate moving around upstairs. So I looked out the window, and his car wasn't there. And that definitely freaked me the hell out. And then, just about two minutes later, I saw his headlights coming down the driveway. A few weeks later, I was using my Tascam 24 Neo. I think that that's what it was called. It was a multi-track music recorder anyway, and I hooked it up to my computer to transfer some songs. We had just recorded some new stuff, and we were going to put it online. We hadn't released anything in quite a while, in fact. We were really proud of these songs though and had worked pretty hard on the recordings and in the middle of exporting a song onto the computer, my recorder froze up. I couldn't get it to do anything and it was just stuck on the screen so I shut it off and turned it back on. Same exact thing though and I don't remember what the screen was but I think it was maybe just some technical stuff that I didn't understand. So I was in a horrible mood and had to go to work. I didn't say anything about it to anybody and all of a sudden the girl that I'm working with starts saying that she's hearing little noises every once in a while. I start paying closer attention and start hearing a few as well. We were standing in the back kitchen and we were just talking about it when all of a sudden the door handle to the back door just starts jiggling. Just a light jiggle at first, kind of like someone was trying to open it but it's locked. She got pretty freaked out and I opened the door and the screen door on the outside was locked and there was nobody there. At the time I told her that I didn't know what was going on. I didn't feel like saying anything about the Ouija board but we then heard the door to the bathroom up front lightly close. I went and looked and there was nobody in the store. Everything died down eventually and I headed home after work soon after. I was driving down our long driveway when in my headlights I see my roommate parked on the side of the driveway, maybe 200 feet from the house. I drive past him and then he starts his car and meets me at the house. He said about five minutes earlier, all the electrical and the lights were freaking out in the house. They were flashing and stuff and I walked in and it all seemed normal to me. Some lights and stuff were still flickering every once in a while but it had definitely calmed down at this point. Nothing really crazy happens for a while after that, but I sent my recorder into Tascam, the manufacturer, to get it fixed. They kept it for probably two months, possibly more. I kept talking to them and calling, but they just couldn't figure it out. They kept trying test after test and nothing seemed to work. They said that they'd never seen anything like it before and it ends up that they just couldn't save it and everything that was recorded on it as well. I actually had two years worth of song ideas and recordings on there and it was just all gone and nobody knew how and it really sucked. After that I looked up some way to get rid of the Ouija board curse and I don't remember what it was exactly but we just cut it into pieces and buried it or something. I don't know if that was the right thing to do or not but I haven't had anything paranormal happen to me since then so for that I'm grateful. Back in autumn of 2010, in my early 20s, I was back at my parents' house, bored, enjoying life with pretty much no responsibilities, waiting for my school program to start in late November. All my friends and brothers were busy either with work or school, so I was looking for some sort of a job that I can do for maybe a month or so full-time and maybe continue part-time when I start school. Mind you, this is in Quebec, Canada, late September, beautiful by the way, and it's already getting pretty cold. My younger brother calls me and tells me that he has given my number to someone who is recruiting people for someone else. No big deal. 
The guy calls me though and tells me that he's looking for people to work for his new company of cleaning services, housekeeping, that has this contract with the YMCA all over the province and that will be paid $25 an hour cash under the table meaning undeclared for basically cleaning up YMCAs and that no professional training was needed for this job. Now, I may have been young at the time, but I was not stupid. There is no job that pays $25 an hour cash, undeclared money for housekeeping because even the professionals who clean up hospitals started around $19 an hour and that's before taxes. So whoever would pay cash for housekeeping would pay maybe $12 an hour maximum $15 an hour and even that would be too generous. Right away my curiosity is peaked though and I have to know what's going on and what this job is really about. We set up a meeting for the next day evening at 5pm. He tells me that he'll come pick me up and take me to his boss. I give him an address in my neighborhood but not where I live. The next day, I dress professionally like someone going for a job interview. I put on a nice autumn coat and underneath my right arm sleeve, I put on a huge sharp knife that can easily kill someone if stabbed at the right spot. Because of past experiences from childhood, I've learned that humans can be really dangerous and so I never trust a stranger. That's a story for another time though. So I go to meet him and he's already there. His car is normal, nothing special about it. I get in the back seat as there's somebody already in the front seat. And the first thing that hits me is the smell of just dried blood. The smell of dried blood is a distinct smell that you can't forget. Like the smell of fresh blood, that metallic smell, unforgettable and again, past experiences from childhood. I get in the car all jovial and courteous, but then I notice that there are actually three in the car. The driver, the guy who I've been talking to is a huge white guy, at least 6 foot 5 tall, fat, in his early 40s. He's not the kind of fat that is obese though, but the kind of fat you know used to be into sports, football or bodybuilding when he was younger or something like that. And he has a coat on and sitting in the passenger seat next to him is this old looking white female, the kind that looks old but is actually not that old, a chain smoker probably and drinks and not yet 50 years old. I'm sitting right behind her and sitting in the back seat next to me, right behind the driver, is this young black male. Definitely older than me but not yet in his 30s. And he smells like beer and looks like he's a bit high or something. Oddly enough, even in this weather, this guy only has a black t-shirt on and blue jeans. Now, my knife can easily go down from my sleeve into my hand. I calculate that if something happens, I can quickly stab the huge driver in the neck. The drunk guy wasn't going to be much of a problem unless he had a knife or something on him and the old lady is not even in the equation. I can tell that they're not prepared for someone like me, or so I thought at least. I'm confident and engage in the conversation to try to know these people. I ask if the two work for him or are going to the interview too and he says no, that they're his friends which was strange too because these people look like they could have used a $25 per hour cash paying job. They don't talk much, if at all, and he tries to make me feel more comfortable and at ease by asking me questions about what I do, what I study. I tell him that I'm into computers, that I sometimes buy used computers and laptops and repair them and resell them. He then tells me that he has a computer to sell at his house and that if I want, we can go to his place and see the computer before going to see the boss. So I tell him that I don't mind. It's mostly silence all the time. All along the black guy in the back seat is making strange sounds though. Talking to himself I think. Almost inaudibly low and laughing to himself as well. Really low as if to warn me or something. That I'm too naive. The whole trip though is definitely eerie. The silence, the smell, the huge driver, the old lady, the strange black guy. I'm pretty big on vibes and this is the most uneasy and strange and weird vibe that I've ever felt. At this point, my intuition is telling me the obvious. This is not a ride to a job interview. And slowly, my confidence is going down as the sun is setting. It's almost six now and where it is duplex. I get out of the car and he gets out too. The lady and the black guy stay in the car and I come face to face with him. That's when I see how huge this guy really is and 
I'm not short. I'm six foot and 220 pounds at this point. I have a pretty good build, but this guy is way taller than me. And I know immediately that in a fight, face to face, me against him with a knife, I would have an advantage over him, but it would take more than one stab wound to stop this guy. This guy could definitely kill me just by hugging me too tight. He comes closer to me, talking straight to me as if to size me up. He turns and he takes me to his basement house. Strange. He lives with his parents and his brother, or so he says, as these people look nothing like him. These people look inbred a little bit, if anything, like the people in the hills have eyes. But the house is modest, though, and he shows me the computer that he wants to sell. An old computer that nobody in their right mind would want to buy. The price is low, and his so-called brother, who is mentally disabled, by the way, comes into the living room screaming that the computer is not for sale. He tells me not to mind his brother, that he's sick. I tell him that I'll think about it tells me to go and wait for him outside. I go out and call my girlfriend and tell her everything. I'm walking further from the car and coming back towards the car to and fro so they don't hear what I'm saying. I'm smoking my cigarette. I look calm, laughing as I'm trying to convince my girl that it's not that bad. I'm lying. The whole thing was really strange. I know for a fact that my storytelling and description of the situation doesn't do it justice. Of course she's begging me to get away from them as quickly as possible. I give her the car plate number and promise her that the next weird thing that happens, I'm out of there. He gets back in the car while I'm tranquil finishing my cigarette. I'm playing it cool, but inside I was getting pretty scared. I get back in the car and it's almost night now. We take the road and it's still extremely silent in the car besides the little noises the black guy would do really. It's night now and... I see that we're taking the route to go out of the city. I ask him about it, and he tells me that the boss lives 30 minutes from the city in a mansion. A no mansion owning boss brings you to his mansion for an interview for housekeeping in the night. I start getting pretty creeped out at this point. Outside of the city, in the woods, it's really dark, and maybe no cell phone service too. Maybe more people there waiting for me. Who knows? As we're about to take the highway, the driver sees someone that he knows. He says to his friends, isn't that Mark? And the black guy says yes. The driver opens the windows and calls the guy and tells the black guy, go and get him. The black guy goes out to get him. I look in the back and they were behind the car and I see the black guy talking to a bum. I'm not even joking. This was a street bum, a fat, dirty looking homeless guy. He's bringing him to the car though and now... I calculate quickly. Me, squeezed in the back seat, with a bum next to me, limited movement, four people trying to tranquilize me. I don't know if they have a tranquilizer or a knife, a gun, but the chances of me getting out of this situation unharmed are definitely slowly diminishing, which means that this is my last chance to get out. I try to open the door and realize that it's locked. I try to unlock it, but I can't. Strange too, because when the black guy went out, his door wasn't locked. I ask the driver to open the door so that I can go outside for a cigarette. He tells me that it's okay that I can smoke inside the car. I tell him that I'd rather smoke outside, so he unlocks the door and I go out and feel really relieved. So relieved in fact that to this day, I thank God for this opportunity, even though I'm not a religious person. I light my cigarette and smile. It's completely dark now. It's cold on a busy street, but I feel a lot safer. The bum and the black guy get into the car, and I tell the driver that I have somewhere to be, which was true, and that I have to reschedule the interview. Right away, the black guy takes my place in the back. He was in the middle seat in the back, waiting for me to get back into the car, and closes the door as if satisfied with my decision. I lean on the passenger side window, the old looking woman's seat, to talk to the driver, so she's in between me and the driver. He's telling me that they can take me wherever I want to go and we'll go see the boss later, blah blah blah. When the woman leans towards underneath her seat, as if to take something from her purse, and quickly he puts his hand on her leg as if to stop her. She slowly sits straight again and I see everything. I smile at them, I 
back up, get away from her window and continue calmly smoking my cigarette on the pavement, enjoying the cold autumn air while he's begging, telling me to come back into the car and that if he doesn't bring a potential worker tonight, that the boss will get really mad. For a $25 an hour job, you don't need to beg anybody. I mean, how many jobs would pay that amount without requesting any qualifications, right? I tell him that I'll just call him. I have further plans for these guys and then I just leave. I'm far away from my parents' house, I'm completely at the other side of town. I walk for a little bit and make sure that they're not following me. I see a bus and I hop in and I go about my business. I get home around 10pm. The driver is still texting me, telling me that the boss is still willing to meet me, mind you, at this late hour. I tell him that I'll just call him back and I call my friends and tell them the story about what happened. I want to go back. I'm willing to go back into the car and go meet this boss outside the city as long as some of my friends and brothers are in the car behind following us, armed and ready for whatever. Back in our teens, we would have done this with pleasure. But these days, my friends have responsibilities. One has a family too. The others have jobs to go to in the morning, so only one of my friends is willing to come. So in the end, we just let it go, like cowards. I still regret that because I would have loved to have caught them in the act and got them in trouble with the cops or something. In the end, I didn't call the police either because I didn't know what to tell them. I grew up being taught not to trust the cops or call them for anything pretty much. That was stupid, I know. And the guy just never called me again. To this day, I still wonder where they wanted to actually take me, what they wanted to do with me, and who this boss actually was that they wanted to take me to. These people did not look like low-level workers, and if anybody has any idea, please feel free to tell me your opinion. One thing that I'm sure of, though, is that there was definitely no $25 an hour cash-paying job waiting for me where I was going. So, this was probably about six or seven years ago now, pegging my age around 16 or 17, I think, in Ohio. I went to school around the supposedly haunted Gore Orphanage Road, and us stupid high schoolers knowing this obviously decided that it would be fun to go adventure seeking, even with the road being illegal to drive down from dusk till dawn due to drug activity, but I'll tell you this much, I never went back after this and I don't plan on doing it in the future either. So if you haven't heard of it, the legend goes like this. There was an orphanage called Gore Orphanage in the Amherst, Ohio area where there was a fire and all of the children and caretaker were killed. I'm recalling all of this by memory as I actually happened to do a research paper on the place one year, but I'm sure I'm missing a few of the details. But one thing that became clear though was that during my research, the legend is complete BS. Now, it's a Friday night and somewhere during football season. I'm thinking it was October maybe? as me and a large group of friends decided to head into a nearby town to get a late night dinner. From there, we just kind of bullcrapped around school, this and that, etc. Before three of my friends, a guy and two girls, who I won't be naming, got onto the subject of Gore Orphanage. And stupidly, we all decided to go at around midnight. So we drove out to where the road starts. It goes downhill into a marsh-like area where there's an actual gate that was supposed to be closed didn't think anything of it at the time because I'd been down there a few times myself and it was never really closed, not even after dark. We make our way down this hill though, messing with each other in the car trying to scare one another. My male friend is driving his car and I'm in the passenger seat and both the females are in the back. The road, down by the marsh area, curves to the right whereupon a little ways forward there's a, a one vehicle bridge. I remember it too because of the copious amounts of graffiti on the metal and guardrails and a sign at the far end of the bridge. I can't remember for the life of me though what kind of sign it was. So, on the other side of the bridge is a little turnaround point. The road dead ends a little ways past this point but on the right side of the road is where the trail starts. The trail to the supposed Gore Orphanage ruins. We briefly, and I mean briefly, discussed parking the car and going down the trail, but screw that, right? But instead of turning around there, we decided to go all the way to the end of the road to the actual turnaround. Here, the driver put the car in park, shut off the engine, and extinguished the headlights. 
It was all just stupid harmless fun, us scaring the girls. We sat there for about five minutes before we decided that we'd had our fun and it was time to go home. The car comes back on, the light goes on, we put it into drive and we were off back on the road. The thing seemed unchanged until we got close to where the trail started. On the left side of the car at the turnaround was a truck parked, engine off. I thought to myself, where the hell did that come from? All of us were on edge a bit now and my friend driving just sat there a few feet back from the truck with his foot on the brake. He was convinced that it was just another group of idiots like us that gave into the idea of going down the trail. Obviously, I didn't give a crap to find out and told him to just get us out of there. But this is where it gets absolutely insane. So we drive forward at a calm speed, passing up the truck and making the slight turn left into the little bridge. And chilling right there on the bridge are 10 or 12 individuals tatted in robes of various colors. Some hooded, some not, and the faces of the unhooded ones were covered in crappy tattoos or dirt or something and had nasty beards and whatnot. And even worse, they were brandishing shotguns and hunting rifles, just staring at us as we came into view. At this point, I'm mortified thinking, holy crap, we're about to die. The girls are absolutely flipping, but what my friend driving did... I will forever be grateful for. As stupid as we'd been up to this point to even find ourselves in this situation that we were currently in, I'm glad that immediately upon catching sight of the Pope's hunting trip, he just gunned it, not even thinking about the possibility of hitting one of them. We sped past them and along the marshlands, now to the right of us before flying up the hill back into the main road. None of us could believe what we had just seen. It honestly felt like I was in a Stephen King novel. We joked about it afterwards, surprisingly, probably just to try and lighten the mood since we almost died, and we thought that that was it, but no. So I get home about 15 minutes away after all of that. I know, pretty terrifying to know that you live so close, and for obvious reasons, I just can't sleep. So I stay up pretty much all night doing whatever it is that I did at that age, played video games or watch TV maybe, but... It's about 5.30 in the morning when my dad comes home from work. He's a state trooper and patrols the local area from time to time, but to this day, I'm still a little confused as to why he asked me about this. As if he physically knew that I felt like being an idiot that night, but he asks me, were you down by Gore Orphanage Road tonight? Thinking that he'd get pretty pissed at me if I said yes. I lied and said no, why? He started taking his bulletproof vest off and his gun belt off before telling me. Yeah, we got a weird call about some satanic crap, like chanting and fire down in the woods from Mr. S. I asked him if he went down there, to which he replied that he did with his cruiser shining a spotlight into the woods. And there was apparently nothing. Mr. S was the father of my friend in the driver's seat that night. I started to think that he told him what happened, but... I later decided that this may not have been the case for two reasons. One, I don't know why he would have said anything to his dad about fire and satanic chanting. Didn't see any of that. And two, they live literally a five minute walk from that area and he might have been able to see and hear these things, so maybe it was just a coincidence. But nonetheless, everything went on as normal from then on out for me and the two girls. However, my friend who lives nearby began to be stalked by people who kept showing up in his front lawn, staring at his house every couple of nights. They would always spray paint things on trees in the front yard too, but he never discussed it with me what they sprayed on the trees, so it beats me what it is. Thankfully, this stopped after about two or three weeks as law enforcement started hanging out more. And as curious as I still am about what they were doing down there, I think it's better that I just don't know. Whether they were worshipping Satan, or sacrificing a goat, or perhaps cooking crystal meth, I'm just glad that my friend's car interior didn't get a makeover consisting of pieces of my brain. This story takes place when I was about 17 in a small border town that I grew up in. I lived in a house on a very steep hill, and I took the bus every morning and after school to come home as well. 
the class started very early and no other students lived on my small street. It must have been during the winter because I was pretty cold every morning, which isn't a usual thing where I lived. So I remember being afraid every morning because it was very dark outside and I only had the light of the moon to guide me. And back then, cell phones didn't have flashlights that you can use to guide your way in the dark. But there were only three other houses on a small street, and they were all on a big hill with a paved driveway going down and meeting a gravel road. The houses were arranged around a gravel cul-de-sac, which many people used to turn around if they went down the wrong road. I live in a desert area too, so there were leafless mesquite trees and cactuses around where it was very reminiscent of a forest or dense floor area. It was so quiet that all you can hear were the bats fluttering around the one streetlight that decided to work on the off day, but usually it was just pitch black and pitch quiet. And along with the occasional yapping of coyotes and crickets chirping, other than that, all I could hear was the crunching of the gravel beneath my feet. So the first time I saw the man in a van, I wasn't that surprised. A lot of the time, we would just get used to these white vans passing through because they delivered the papers to the surrounding houses. But I then started to realize pretty quickly that this van would stop right next to me when I was standing alone waiting for the bus to arrive. And there was a stop sign there, but there was no reason for the person in the van to be stopped there for 10 minutes until the bus picked me up. He must have started to get brave too after that because he would roll down his window and ask me if I was cold say yes and ignore his presence and pretend like nothing happened. I just figured that he was trying to be nice to me. He was an older Hispanic man in his late 70s after all. Again, the next day he pulls up even closer to me this time and says, are you cold? You look beautiful today, but you look so cold. This time I just ignored him and waited for the bus to pull up and I got in. I would watch this van pull away after my bus left too. He kept doing this for two weeks too until one day he looked at me through his window and said I could use a pretty girl like you. It's cold outside. You must be so cold. Come inside my van and I'll keep you warm until your bus gets here. I looked at him in horror and luckily the bus pulled up a few seconds later and I decided that at this point I needed to tell someone about him. My dad is in law enforcement and I told my dad what had been happening. He asked me what he looked like and when the van would pull up and he said that I should have told him sooner but he's glad that I told him when I did. He called the police and I told the police what had been happening. They said that they had similar reports in the area and that they would catch him. The next day the police hid behind me where the cul-de-sac is and I stood in my usual spot where I stood for the bus. I remember that day the streetlight was finally working and I could see the man's face in the van. And he didn't realize the officer was there until he made a full turn around the cul-de-sac and started towards me when the police turned their lights on and pulled him over. I could hear him yelling as the bus pulled in and I left for school and I could see the police lights glaring on the bus windows. And the next day my dad sat me down and told me that he had to talk to me because apparently the man had many suspicious things in his van. He apparently had duct tape, plastic bags, zip ties, condoms, lube, black trash bags, a machete and some other strange things. He claimed to be a newspaper man and said that he was distributing newspapers to my neighborhood. But the police never even found one newspaper in his van when they had searched it. My dad ran a background check on him and he had a really seedy past. I'm not sure whatever happened to that man legally, but he never showed his face on the street again. But whenever I stood there at the end of the street, all I could think about is that if he had gotten the courage to step out of his van, that I would have had no way to have defended myself, and no one would have ever heard from me again. Two years ago, I moved out into rural Indiana with some of my best friends to share a pretty large apartment that was above my best buddy's dad's garage. Since most of my family is from that area, most of them have known about the house their whole life and all of them pretty much unanimously agreed that it was haunted. Before my friend's dad moved in, the place had actually been a church. One wing was the actual chapel and the other was living quarters. My mum said that multiple exorcisms had been done there 
and she once watched the double doors to the living quarters fly open and something stomped down some stairs, all during an exorcism. Hell, even when I got there, my other friend that I was living with showed me the unused concrete basement, and in there was a room that seemed to serve no purpose whatsoever, bigger than a closet but smaller than a typical room and the only thing in the room was a symbol painted on the middle of the wall that gave us really bad vibes. We googled it actually and it turned out to be a symbol that represented some demon who preferred taking children's souls or some crap like that. We can't remember exactly what it was. Anyway, it's 1am and all of my roommates are asleep and I decided that I'm going to go outside and smoke something and look at the moon and listen to some Radiohead to relax myself after work. Usually I take our pit bull pup, Sweetie, with me and go around the back of the garage towards the forest. Sweetie is so well trained that she'll just stick with you without a leash and typically scares off packs of coyotes that lurk around. However, as I'm walking towards the forest, Sweetie stops and starts whining and won't follow me like she usually does, so I tell her to come on, but she just refuses to go. I take her back to the apartment and have her sit on my bed and she's shaking at this point, but stupid me decided that it was okay and went back around to the garage outside and started walking towards the forest again. But this time, I noticed something was walking alongside of me, pretty much directly next to me, in my peripheral. I just kept going until something just clicked in my head that said, you didn't imagine that, and I turned to see what it was next to me, and it was... A white figure that was as tall as my waist and it was wearing a dress and then something whispered in my ear and I just took off running at this point into the huge backyard area where I usually smoke. After smoking for a bit and listening to In the Rainbows for the thousandth time in my life to calm me down, I decided that I must have just imagined it and Sweetie probably just saw a coyote that was bigger than usual or something like that. So I decided that I'm done and I'm just ready for bed and I'd pretty much forgotten about the white figure so I'll head back the way that I came since it's the faster way back to the apartment. And this is where most people don't believe me. So I started walking into the huge open area that was the forest behind it and I saw something running in the darkness. A curious me kept watching to see what it was and I could make out two legs and that it was pretty large, but it was sprinting really fast. I watched it for a little bit until I noticed that this large hulking shadow person thing was full on sprinting towards me though and beginning to show itself in the moonlight. And it was at this point that I just booked it, but I could hear something following me all the way back until I got to our door. My friends have told me some of their stories too, but no one believes the last part of mine. But I know what I saw and I know that it was real. I wasn't tired and I wasn't imagining things and I've never had this happen to me in the past or since then and whatever it was, it was weird and it actually happened. This happened when I was probably about 7 or 8. I don't remember all of the details, but I do remember some of the really messed up stuff. So when I was a kid, I lived in a pretty sketchy neighborhood. We lived in those uh, long apartments, the ones that are attached at the sides rather than stacked on top of each other. The front of the apartments faced the main road, and there was a little side street to access the parking in the backyards of the apartments. Behind the apartments was a massive field too and it was super overgrown, so much so that it was almost like a little forest. And my friends and I used to go back there to build hobbit holes in the grass and whatnot. My mum actually hated it when we went out there because there were some, well, rough people that lived in the neighbourhood and she didn't like a group of seven year olds playing out where people also shot up heroin. But anyway... One day I was out in the woods by myself, just exploring and pretending to be Indiana Jones or something. As I was coming out of the tall grass, I could see the little back alley in between the parking and the houses and the woods. And I saw a deer lying in the grass. I thought that it was just sleeping, so I actually crept up on it to try and scare it. I know, not cool, but I was young and stupid. When I got there though, I just knew that something was off. The deer was just too still and it just smelled horrible. 
I couldn't see its face as its back was facing me, but when I got up to it, I nearly had a heart attack when I saw that its entire stomach was ripped open and all of the insides were just spewed out everywhere around the ground. Now, I wasn't a smart kid by any means, but I knew that this was pretty messed up. When I turned to run back home to tell my mum, I saw a second deer nailed to the tree next to the first deer. I don't know how I didn't notice this before, but its two front hooves were nailed above its head to the tree, the stomach was also cut open, and the ribs had been broken open to expose the gaping hole. As I stood there, just staring at it, a car drove past on the little alleyway. I remember it was a white car with tinted windows and was driving really slowly. I mean, everyone drove slowly on this alley because, well, there was a residential street, but these people were barely even moving. I couldn't see inside, but I just got the sinking feeling that they were just watching me. Obviously, I couldn't be sure that they were the ones who mutilated the deer, but I'm like 99% sure that it was them. Once they were gone, I booked it home and I told my mum the whole thing. She told me not to go into that field anymore, and after that, I happily agreed. I didn't particularly enjoy seeing a deer's insides, and I would have loved to have just forgot about that whole thing. For the next month or so though, I just saw that car pretty much everywhere. It would drive up the main road while I was playing in the front yard, it would drive down the back alley when I'd be in the backyard, and I even remember seeing it at the grocery store when my mum and I were shopping. That could have just been another tinted window white car, but they were definitely stalking the house, I know that much. It was always the white car, and always the tinted windows, and always driving way too slowly to be normal. I told my mum about it, but she just chalked it up to just being a neighbour down the road or something. But one day, my mum was out mowing the front lawn. Because of the way the apartments were set up, she had to push the lawnmower around all of the apartments to get to our backyard. And being the helpful little kid that I was, I was going to meet my mum out the back to open the gate for her so she could put the lawnmower in the little shed. As I'm walking out to the gate, I see the car come along the back alley. Normally, the car goes slow, as I've been saying, but as soon as it turned the corner, however, the driver stepped on the gas and zoomed up to me. The back door closest to me opened and someone got out and started running toward me. I don't remember what he looked like, or even if it was a he. I just remember hauling ass back into the house and pissing myself the whole time. After that, my dad yelled at me for peeing myself, and neither he nor my mum believed me about the guy in the car, and I never saw them again after that and we moved a few months later too. My parents still think that I made the whole thing up even though they know how sketchy the neighborhood was. I don't remember anyone going missing around that time in my town and I didn't find anything when I googled it but it was really messed up and I have no idea who those people in the car were, why they mutilated the deer like that or what they may have had planned for me. I still kick myself for my stupidity during this event. So, this happened during the summer when I was 14, about 16 years ago. My parents had just moved me to this new house that they had built in a rural part of Pennsylvania. It was 2004 and the housing market hadn't crashed yet, so our new house was one of the first in this brand spanking new neighborhood. It was the kind of neighborhood that you drive through and go, yep, these people definitely have money. I hadn't started school yet in my new town, so I had no friends to really hang out with that summer, so I'd just spend a lot of time just hanging out with my mum, taking drives around our new area, and staying up and watching movies and whatnot. One night in early August, though, we had just finished watching something and were getting ready to go to bed. It was one of those summer nights that caused the windows to fog up from the cool air inside. You couldn't see anything out the windows, though, unless you pressed your face to them. As we turned everything in the downstairs off, we saw headlights come down our street. Mind you, it was about 1am, in a brand new neighbourhood with about four houses in it and maybe two more under construction. We didn't have neighbours at this point either, and there was literally no reason for someone to be on the street unless they were A, lost, or B, looking to steal stuff. But we hope it's A, and keep going about our business to get ready for bedtime. And then we see the reflection of another light outside of our house and it wasn't car light. 
heads. Once again, we can't see out of our fogged windows, so me being a curious 14 year old, I walked right up to the front door and pressed my face to the window and immediately fell right back to the floor because as soon as I looked out there, there was a face staring straight back at me. My mum asked me what was wrong and I just started stammering. Then my adrenaline kicked in. I ran to the kitchen and opened the knife drawer. I pulled out a butcher knife and walked back to the front door. I'm still shaking from basically being nose to nose with a complete stranger and my 14 year old brain thought that this was a great idea. I flung open the front door and wheeled at the butcher knife and to my shock and surprise, I see not one, but three full grown men outside. And my dumb ass just ran full speed towards them with a butcher knife over my head. And luckily for me, they ran. After this, my mother called the police while yelling at me for being such a dumbass, but despite my stupidity in the situation, I've always been slightly proud of three grown men being afraid of a tiny 14-year-old girl wielding a butcher's knife. This took place back in 2007. I was 13 years old, and up until then, I hadn't really experienced anything paranormal. I can remember it was a normal summer night though. I was watching TV and it was maybe uh, 9 or 10 I think. When I started to hear something but at first I thought it was just the TV. Then I kept hearing it for the next few minutes and the more I heard it the more I realized that it was the faint sound of a baby crying. I didn't think much of it. I thought maybe my sister brought over my nephew or something and he had a distinct cry when he was younger. So I went out to say hi to them, but there was nobody outside. I kept hearing the cry too, and it sounded like it was coming from the wooded area below our house. I walked maybe 10 or 20 yards into the darkness to see if I could see anything, but nothing. And chills immediately went up my spine, and I ran back into the house. We live out in the middle of nowhere, and the nearest neighbor was five miles away. And I told my dad about it the next morning, and he said that my granddad experienced the same thing. Years before, he woke up in the middle of the night to hear a baby crying. He went out to the wooded area and tried looking for it. He spent 30 minutes wandering in the dark with a flashlight trying to find it, but nothing. To this day, I still have no idea what it was that I heard, and I refuse to go down to that wooded area even though we chopped down most of the trees. Around six years ago, my buddies and I had a little tradition of sorts during our senior year of high school where we'd stay out all night skating and exploring all kinds of spooky areas. And this was before any of us had a car too, so everything was travelled by foot. Now one night in particular... We had ventured out over an hour from our usual exploration areas and we came across a heavily wooded area that we hadn't been through before. The time had to have been around 2 or 3 in the morning and just looking into those woods gave me an incredible feeling of unease that I had never felt before. My buddies were determined to go through it though but I decided against it and instead told my friends that I'd just skate or walk around and meet them at the gas station on the other side. It took me around 30 minutes to skate around the entire area. I waited at the exit of the woods for about 15 minutes before crossing the four lane street that led to the gas station and I asked the clerk if three other teens had come in and he tells me no so I head back out to wait in the front. 10 more minutes pass before I can hear very heavy footsteps moving quick from behind the gas station's main building. Next thing I know I see all three of my buddies sweating out of breath and looking like they witnessed a murder. We head into the gas station and sit at the small seating area. They then go on to tell me that somewhere halfway into those woods, they heard strange noises behind them and when they turned around to look, they saw a tall white figure with red eyes staring at them. They said that they freaked out and just took off. As they neared the end of the woods though, they could hear the leaves and the branches rustling as if it was chasing them. They kept running until they crossed the road separating the woods from the gas station and once they were at the back of the gas station they looked back and could see the figure just standing at the edge of the woods, unmoving. 
way they described it was that it was only vaguely shaped like a human, more like a, a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot type creature, but was white in color and had piercing red eyes. Honestly, I had never seen anyone so distressed in the way that my friends were that night, but they genuinely seemed terrified, and that night was the last time that they ever wanted to stay out all night again. I still think about this night a lot, even to this day. So when my parents were in college, they went on a trip down to Florida. They had met through mutual friends and were down there together but hadn't gone on a date yet. My dad and one of his friends were planning to meet my mum and some of her friends at a hotel, but being the carefree college guys that they were, they lost track of time and realized that it was impossible to get to the hotel on time by walking. They decided that the best solution to their problem was just to hitchhike, and a car with two women picked them up. Everything seemed fine too until the driver asked if it was okay to stop for gas. My dad and his friend agreed that it was no problem since they were making good time and she drove into a gas station. She then pumped a car full of gas before hopping back in and flooring it, basically stealing the gas with two hitchhikers in the back. My dad and his friend were beginning to freak out when she pulled a gun from under a seat and asked, are we going to have a problem or something like that. My dad and his friend shook their heads vehemently because what else do you do in that situation? And then she drove them to the hotel and dropped them off without so much as a scratch. And they kind of thought nothing of it until the news started reporting on a serial killer in Florida known as Eileen Warners. He took one look at her picture and instantly recognized her as the driver. The only reason my dad thinks that she didn't straight up kill them was because they were super polite and respectful to her and her victims were usually scumbag guys trying to take advantage of her. Let me start by giving a little bit of background. So I'm 23, 5'2 and female. I'm by no means intimidating, even when I try. I work two days of night ordered for a hotel in a heavily populated area of Houston, Texas with zero security. And if you know anything about Houston, you know that it can never be good news. With all that being said, last Tuesday, I was alone playing stupid games online and listening to Ryan's Roses to pass the time. Around 1am, this man with a crazed look in his eyes wanders in. I have cameras right next to the desk, and I saw zero movement before the doors slide open. And Anyways, he walks up to the desk and refuses to look me in the eyes until I ask him if he's doing alright. He snaps his head up, looks me right in the eyes and says, No, I am not alright at all. I'm kind of taken aback by this, so I apologize and ask if there's anything that I can do, etc. He declines and then asks if he can get a drink from the little shop next to the desk. I tell him, yeah, of course, go ahead and get whatever you'd like. The prices are listed there on the wall. Before he walks away to get his drink, he makes sure to tell me, now don't worry, I have money, I would never steal from you like that. I didn't really say anything, just kind of smiled at him and nodded understandingly. And well, he wasn't lying, he for sure had money because he handed me two bloody dollar bills. So now, all the alarm bells are definitely ringing in my head. He starts apologizing though and asking if I'm mad at him and if he had upset me and all of which I said, no sir, I'm not even a little bit upset. It was getting boring in here anyways. I suddenly though became painfully aware of how empty the entire hotel was at that moment. He stands there for a minute, takes a drink and then makes eye contact for two seconds before he tells me that he needs me to call the cops. I start shaking but somehow managed to not let off that I was absolutely terrified. I get the police dispatcher on the line and begin giving all of the information into our location. Then, from the background, he starts saying that he was almost hit by a car while walking in the middle of the road. The dispatch then asks to speak to him, so I hand the guy the phone and he starts looking around while describing himself. He then stops looking around and looks right into my eyes and says, Yeah, I'm going to end myself on the freeway. Now, I don't take that lightly, no matter who says it. An audible gasp left my lips and... It was like it woke something up in him because his eyes just lit up. 
he then hangs up the phone and like slams it down on the counter in front of my computer and just looks at me. I try to make small talk, asking what's going on and how he's really doing tonight, but nothing. He just avoids those questions and starts asking some questions about the hotel, like, what is your nightly rate tonight? He then goes from harmless questions to asking if I'm alone and when my manager will be back and if I lock all the doors around me. And now, I'm definitely afraid. I pick up what he's putting down and I want no part in whatever he was planning if he managed to get me out from behind the desk. I switch gears on conversation and tell him that he's more than welcome to take a seat in one of the comfortable chairs in the lobby until the police arrive. He then thanks me and asks me again for like the 20th time if I'm mad at him. When he sits down, I get even more uneasy though because he starts looking around anxiously. You know that look someone gets whenever they're working up the nerve to do something, but they just haven't yet? Yeah, that's the look and the vibe that he was giving off at that moment. Around that time, my brain finally pieces together what is actually happening because another guest pulls up right in front of the lobby and his face immediately drops any excitement and in fact he almost looks mad. In comes this woman and her son who couldn't have been more than 12 years old. They came up, no reservations, so it was now a walk-in which takes a little longer since I have to put in all of her information instead of just checking in and moving along to the next and her son starts whispering something to her that neither of us can make out. So he says it louder, and then he says, Mum, didn't we just see him walking around at the hospital? My blood runs cold, and she tells her son to hush, and locks eyes with me, and I hand her paperwork to sign. She takes that opportunity to secretly ask me if I'm okay, if the police need to be called, and if I'm concerned. I tell her that yes, I'm terrified, and the cops are on their way. I can see him straining to hear what we're saying, so I stop and tell her about breakfast and all that good stuff, and she tells me that she'll not be leaving me alone, that she'll stay with me until the cops come because something just doesn't feel right. And God bless this woman. I'll never forget her face and her heart. After the cops had come and taken him away, mental hospital I presume, she comes back in from just outside the doors where she also called the police. She comes up and tells me that they just left the hospital up the road visiting her sister and passed him on their way out, where he was wandering around the hospital parking lot with his head down. They came straight to the hotel, but he had beat them here, and he swore that he walked here, but there's just no way that he walked here and beat them. She said that she felt like something was off as soon as she walked in and saw him. She told me that he was likely trying to lure me out from behind the desk, making me feel bad for him, but whatever he was planning... I never want to find out. So let me first preface this with a note. This isn't being shared to be analyzed or to have someone pop up and say it was demons or ghosts or otherwise. I do strongly suspect that it was ghosts, but being a skeptic in such things, I I can't say 100% sure that that's exactly accurate. It may have been just my child mind interpreting things oddly. Who knows? Also, the location that I describe does not exist anymore, having been destroyed in a highway widening project sometime between 1990 and 2000. So, when I was rather young, in second grade in fact, my family lived in the country, out in the middle of nowhere in Mississippi. There were no children for me to play with, and I tended to get a bit more lonely than you'd expect. When we were in the process of moving out there, parents had this double wide trailer. There was one incident that took many years to be certain that I hadn't imagined it. But while on one of the expeditions to the plot where my family was going to put the trailer, my mother needed to make a stop to use the restroom. With no gas stations for a good 10 miles, dad pulled the truck down this dirt road looking for a place to stop. And there, maybe 200 to 300 yards from the two lane road, we found what looked like to be an abandoned gymnasium from a school. Dad decided to use that place as the bathroom and we headed in. I don't really recall much about the building, though one thing always stuck out in my mind. Near the doors where we entered through was this rather massive pile, or massive in my child mind anyway, of clothing. I remember too after doing his business that my father stood at the front of it looking up at the clothing and 
He seemed to be thinking of something, but he never said anything about it. Several weeks later, with the trailer in place, we moved out there and the gym was largely forgotten by me. However, that didn't stop weird things from happening. Well, not weird in the sense of stuff moving around or anything of that sort, but just weird sounds. But within a month or so of living there, I was playing on the front porch when I heard laughter. Now, before I go further though, let me clarify as to where we live then. The trailer was a good hundred feet back from a dirt road, and across the road was the home of an elderly gentleman that I'll call O. Behind his house was a rather extensive stand of pine trees that reached down to the two-lane highway, probably a distance of 500 to 600 feet total between where I was and the highway. But in any case, but in any case, as I sat on the front porch my father had built, playing with some of my toys, I just kept hearing laughter. Not one child's laughter either, but several. It sounded to my ears like five or six kids were playing somewhere, if I had to guess, off behind where I lived. Not having anyone to play with too, I remember wondering where these kids were, and if they'd play with me. Walking up the road, I could tell that the kids seemed to be playing in the woods, as their laughter came and went. And after a moment, I called out to them that I wanted to play too. And as soon as I said that, the laughter just cut off. It was just a dead silence. One moment there was laughing and fun, and the next it was so quiet that you could hear a pin drop. I decided that I'd just scared the kids off and I just went back inside at this point. This happened several times too and eventually I just gave up. I'd hear the kids laughing and playing but they never seemed to get closer and after a couple of times of this I remember telling my mother and she got this really odd look on her face before telling me that she didn't want me playing at front any longer. But we lived there for another year or two before we moved and I largely forgot about the experience, if I'm being honest. It wasn't until many years later when the story came up again in conversation with my parents. That's when I found some of the story out too, and personal investigation told me the rest. So my mother said that the reason she reacted that way was because she'd heard a rumor that the area that we moved to was actually haunted. She didn't have all the details, but felt that it was tied to the old gym, and all she could say or would say was the quote, something bad had happened and she was afraid. After my parents passed away, I kind of forgot the story again and it always stuck in the back of my head as just something weird, but that was it. Eventually though, one bored night, I happened to stumble across the website for the church that we had attended. On a lark, I shot an email off to the pastor asking if there had been a gym near where I remembered. I didn't expect to hear back. But two months later, I checked my email to find that yes, he had actually replied. And here is what he related to me. There had been a gym that once stood near where I described, though it had long since been torn down. The gym had been a part of a private school which had stood there from roughly 1900 to about 1979 or 80. And in the early spring of that year, a tornado had gone through and demolished most of the wing of the school, and in doing so, killing a number of students. The building had collapsed, burying the students under the rubble, resulting in the death of a number of them and I think between 10 and 15 students or something. And after this, it was decided to close the school. As they were demolishing it too, they cleaned out clothing from lockers and various places, dumping it in the gym in the tall pile that I remember seeing. The gym had been left standing because it was hoped that one of the local churches might use it, but given what had happened there, well, it just ended up being left abandoned. Curiously though, the property behind O's house had also been a part of the school's property at one time, being used by the students as a kind of playground area. This did explain why O kept digging up old toys, mostly metal trucks and such, which he gave to me. Looking back though, I've come to the conclusion that what I had been hearing was in some way tied to the old school and the loss of life there. Though, I also wonder if in some way it was just my childhood imagination running wild or something like that. That's probably one of the problems that I have with this story too. For all I know, my parents could have mentioned what happened at the school at some point and I just overheard it. And in my lonely state, my mind and imagination may have just run wild. Whatever the case though, I thought that you'd find the story interesting to say the least. So 
I was working the evening shift at a gas station, and a man comes in all disorientated. I go to help him out, and he has a huge gash on his head and doesn't know where he is. I couldn't see any crashes around, so assumed that he must have fallen or something. Normally, we're supposed to stay inside the glass shielded register area whenever anyone is in the store, but I, being a nice human being, went to help by calling the police and EMS. They got there and checked him out, and they thought that his head may have been fractured. They took him into the ER, and I just went back to work. The cops stopped back by for some coffee a few hours later, and they told me that the guy had actually been hit by a baseball bat while trying to break into a little girl's bedroom and was wanted for rape and murder in two other states. And well, I never left the register area at night again. Last night, from Wednesday to Thursday, I was home alone because, well, my girlfriend sleeps at her home every Wednesday, and because she doesn't like smoking, I usually smoke on Wednesday nights and Thursday mornings when she isn't with me. I wait for the night so I can go to the garden of my grandma and just smoke without being seen. It's the kind of garden where about 14 people have their own area. I hope you get what I'm talking about. The garden of my grandma is one of the least completely in the back. Usually when I'm there at night, I just get a chair and watch the night while smoking. Nothing's ever happened before, but last week there was a birthday party of some younger people who may have seen me, but they weren't really paying attention to me and their party was in the front of this garden area anyway. But last night was very different. So I got my smokes out at home and got my dog and headed to the garden at about 12.30am. Nothing ever really happened there and I was just looking forward to just kind of relaxing and looking up at the sky and whatnot and as I arrived there, something was just off. It was the first time that I'd ever been there and the door wasn't locked. Even last week's party people locked the door while being inside. And well, I stuck in and looked around, seeing if somewhere was the, seeing if there were any lights on or something. But there was nothing. So in the end, I just thought that maybe the last person just forgot to log it or something. I walked down the path to my grandma's garden. I bound my dog on a chain about two meters in front of me, and I'm just sitting there on a chair facing the path so I would see if someone was coming. Right behind me too, there were some thick bushes and a fence. Behind the fence is about another meter thick bush and tree layer, so you'd have a pretty hard time seeing in from the outside. And well, I made myself comfortable and I began to smoke. Sadly, it was a cloudy day and I couldn't really see any stars. But at some point, I recognized something just out of the corner of my eye. Something was standing behind me, about one and a half meters high and about three meters away to my right. Obviously scared, I just kind of froze and just watched. And as I focused, I noticed that it was a black outline of a little chubby person. His head was sneaking out from the left side of the tree and then it hit again. The tree is right next to the way to get out of the garden and on the left side of the tree is my grandma's garden house. It's not that big but there are two windows without glass where you can look inside and outside. And just a few moments later, me still staring back at this dude to my right, I started to see movement to my left coming from the garden next to ours. There's a fence between the garden areas but I could still see something. And there was another guy, fully black, a humanoid figure, just a little more athletic looking than the other one, sneaking on his tippy toes, walking straight towards me. They were still about three to four meters away, and my dog must have sensed the person to the left as she was staring right at the person walking towards me. At some point, she tried to run away, but the leash didn't let her escape, so she just hid her body behind the corner while peeking her head around. And now this person is just standing there, observing both of us. I turned my head to the left and to the right to see if there was anybody else, but there was no one else and the person was just standing there watching me. I panicked and I started thinking, did I just come straight into a trap of some robbers or something, or are they going to attack me? I get myself ready to seem confident and strong, ready to fight if some of them were going to get any closer, when I heard someone walking towards the fence from the outside. As I turned my head to see what was making the noise behind me, I started to see what was going on. I had just been encircled by some sort of void black persons, all watching me from around two to three meters distance. 
Someone was standing outside on the other side of the fence, someone to my left and also to my right, diagonally. In every direction, someone was watching me, and then I noticed that there were more, and some of them were trying to hide behind bushes, some just standing in plain sight. I tried to shout, you know I can see you, what do you want? But I just wasn't as loud as I wanted to be, and for some reason I just felt weak. There was no reaction from any of them either. Some were moving a bit, even trying to hide better behind their covers, but none of them really were good in hiding. There must have been about eight of them, and I tried to stay calm and just keep sitting in my chair, my dog in front of me just sitting there staring at the second guy, when another person appeared behind the guy from the tree, laid on the floor, and slowly crawled on the floor further to my right. His crawling looked just ridiculous too, and... I made a hand gesture to the other people like, are you kidding me? I mean, his crawling was neither stealthy or necessary. And well, I'm sitting there now for about 15 to 20 minutes frozen, just staring back at them. The first person that just appeared just started walking towards me. But me still thinking real humans were behind this whole scenario, I had to rethink. As it was coming closer to me, the black color of his body though just vanished and... It was like a 2D transparent humanoid-like figure. And when I really tried to see them, I could only see the outlines, and even though the person was transparent when looking through the body, it was like looking through fluid or something. I couldn't really see it anymore, just see that it must have stood right in front of me. Every other person still just kept their position, me just questioning my own sanity. I just ran to my dog and I brought her to my chair. Still being watched by all these figures, I now could also see that someone was standing in the garden house peeking through the window, and I took some deep breaths as I was trying to understand the situation in which I just got myself into, when out of nowhere, something, its body looked kind of like something out of Star Wars, was walking the garden path. It came from the left, the end of the garden, to the right, the garden area entrance, and just before it was going to walk behind the house, it turned itself towards me. It looked like it was holding a laser pointer in its hand or something, sending out orange light but bigger than a centimeter, pointing straight in my face. But it didn't really blind me and suddenly, and I can tell you that this was definitely the most scary part, three red glowing lights appeared from the head of this thing and it kind of looked like a helmet. I can tell you that I honestly thought that I was about to be shot at this moment, but to my surprise, nothing happened just silence again and everything just observing me. I really tried to see this thing that was giving off this red light, but it was like the red light was pointing towards me, not letting me see its characteristics. Another 15 minutes went by, me thinking how could I get out of this situation and my dog already shaking. What's weird too is that my dog usually barks at everyone and everything unknown, but this whole time there was not even one sound. At some point, eventually, I just take my bag and my dog and, walking in a little faster speed than regular, I just walk straight out of the garden. As I was standing up from the chair, the red light disappeared and the person behind the tree to my right just ran away. As I was leaving the garden, I looked around to see if someone was nearby as I headed to the entrance of the garden area, but there was nothing. And gladly, nothing was following me and eventually, I got home safe. This happened in summer of 2018. I had just finalized a divorce and moved back to my hometown. My parents let me stay at their place until I found my own and I had just started a high paying job but I was in so much debt from the divorce that I wasn't ready to pay for a place of my own. I didn't want to mooch off my parents so I decided to find a roommate for the interim. I found a sweet woman, Raquel, about 15 years older than me, who wanted someone to move in for only three to four months with her and this was perfect for me since I was still paying off my debt. Everything about Raquel was such a delight too. She was sweet, very clean, cared about the environment, volunteered and would actually cook me food just because. I honestly thought that I'd hit the jackpot with her. However, there were a few things about Raquel that were just a little bit off. One, she wouldn't tell me what she did for a living. She said that it was confidential. 
and whatever her job is, it caused her to be gone for days and sometimes weeks at a time even. I thought that maybe she worked for the government because she had a framed photo of her with Bush Jr. in the Oval Office. When I asked her about it, she said that was my last day before leaving the Secret Service. Even though this was odd, I must admit that I was very impressed. But she also had a very strict rule. Every door in the house, including my room, had to be open at all times if it wasn't being occupied. However, this rule didn't apply to her room. Her door was to remain closed at all times, whether she was there or not. And obviously, I was never allowed to go in. Which was strange, but not too concerning, right? And she also claimed to be wicked. I don't know much about the practice, but she was apparently really into it. She was constantly going to a nearby store and buying all the books and garnishes and whatnot. But besides these few things, she was a very normal person. And a month went by without any concern. But I should quickly mention too that she had two cats. They would mostly stay in her room, but when they wanted out, they would hit the door with their paws. My room was right next to hers, so the sound would drive me crazy. If she wasn't home and I heard the cats trying to get out, I would often open her door just enough so that they could run out. I know that this was breaking the rules, but it drove me crazy and I kind of felt sorry for them too. But everything got too weird one night when she was out of town for work. It was the first night of her being gone and I was sitting in my room just watching TV when I started to hear what sounded like the cats hitting the door trying to get out. I thought... Great, she forgot to let the cats out before leaving again. I opened my door to go and let them out of her room when something made me stop dead in my tracks. The cats were just chilling in the hallway. They weren't in the room, but I know that I heard something. Already creeped out, I decided to open her door and peek inside. And what I saw were four people, naked, holding hands in a circle with their heads bowed as if they were praying. And well, needless to say, I noped the heck out of there and headed to my parents. I tried calling Raquel, but I just couldn't get a hold of her. And right when I was about to call the police, she finally called. And man, she was livid. She said that I would broken her only rule and she wanted me out immediately, which was fine by me at this point. But the eerie part was when I got my bed and dresser back... There was a weird symbol carved in the wood that wasn't there before. But the only way I can describe it is like a, a plus sign, but instead of straight lines, they were kind of curved. Like if someone cut an oval in half down the middle and then tried to make a plus sign out of it. I'm really not sure what it was supposed to mean, but to be honest, I don't think that I want to know. This happened quite a few years back when I was around 14 years old. Let me just preface this too by saying that I had previously been told by my old best friend, Jenna, that her neighbor had some really creepy tendencies. I slept over at her place a lot, but never encountered a creepy neighbor. This guy was married and had children apparently, and his house was directly behind Jenna's place. There was a wooden fence in her backyard too that separated the neighbor's backyard and theirs, and Jenna had a deck and the stairs were a few feet off from the house so you could fit a fairly small person in between the deck stairs and the house. You could also see into the neighbor's backyard if you were standing on the deck but not if you were on the grass. So with that understood, we had half a day at school and I went back to Jenna's place. I wasn't allowed over that day but since we were inseparable it really didn't matter and we weren't expecting her mum to be home from work for a good few hours anyway. Her mum ended up coming home early, so Jenna and I scrambled to the backyard so her mum wouldn't see me, so as not to get in trouble. We went outside and wedged ourselves in between the stairs and the house so her mum wouldn't hear the fence gate open as it made a lot of noise whenever it was opened. We waited for a couple of minutes until we started hearing shuffling in her neighbour's backyard. We could faintly see him through the cracks of the wood and it looked like he was putting out his recycling or garbage or something. Instead... He was making his way onto the bin and poking his head over the fence to look into their windows. From the backyard, you could see into Jenna's mum's window, the bathroom too, and parts of the kitchen. And we saw him, but he didn't see us. 
but we were shaking and holding onto each other for dear life as we watched our neighbor just stand upright on the bin to get a better view into the windows. He kept shifting from bin to bin to get better angles into what we assumed later was Jenna's mum's room since she just got back from work and possibly into the bathroom. This went on for five to ten minutes as well, us trembling and trying not to make a move or make noise while her creepy neighbor just kept trying to look into Jenna's house. He eventually got back down and went into a house like nothing had happened while Jenna and I hopped a fence gate soon after. A few weeks later, we had another incident too where Jenna's sister took a shower late at night and went to her room. Her blinds were open and it was dark outside. There was a tree that sat in the front yard and it was snowing pretty heavily. She called us on her phone saying that she apparently saw someone in the trees and couldn't see them anymore. We told her to turn her light off while Jenna and I did the same in her room and we peeked out the window but couldn't see anything. We went to her sister's room though and asked what happened and she was convinced that she saw someone in the tree who she believed was their neighbor. And so Jenna and I went out front to investigate. By that time he was obviously gone but we did find fresh shoe prints in the snow that went from the neighbor's front yard to the tree and right up to Jenna's sister's window before it trailed off back to the neighbor's house. Technically, this isn't my story, it's my mum's, but I'm slightly involved, so I'd like to share it. This happened when I was around three or possibly four since it was in the summer. My parents and I had just moved into a new house in a safer neighborhood in order to raise me. And basically, they were looking for new 60s themed furniture for our house, so my mother took to Craigslist to try and find some. She eventually reached out to a man selling an older couch. She had just taken me out of preschool before going to his house, so I was in the car with her. My mother is generally a very intelligent woman, although I'll admit being a first-time mother, this wasn't the best idea. But she had left me in the car because she didn't think it would take so long. He was standing outside of the house and, according to her, seemed like a completely average man, probably in his late 40s. He claimed the couch was in the basement and that they would have to go down there. Apparently, the couch was completely different than the one placed in the ad, so she turned around to ask him about it, and he was sweating out of his mind and apparently just started asking her a bunch of really creepy questions along the lines of, are you a virgin, how old are you, and are you married? My mother left pretty quickly after that and claims that he even chased after her down the driveway. She drove off as quickly as possible and to this day says that she thought that he was going to hit her over the head or something and sell her or something along those lines. This happened on a beach in the Philippines about two years ago. Me and my friends decided to take a quick vacation to let off some steam from work and on our first night we decided to drink outside of the hotel room. We got a little tipsy and one of my friends decided to take a walk on the beach and try to meet some other tourists there. I had a bit of a bad feeling about what might happen to him since he was already drunk. So I decided to join him together and with another friend. He said that he wanted to visit the rock formations which is a known gay hookup spot since the place was dark and there were no other establishments on that part of the shoreline. It stretches about half the length of a football field with just pure darkness. I was reluctant about the idea of him going in there. I must admit that I was reluctant about the idea of him going in there, but he was adamant, so I agreed as long as he comes back after a few minutes. Me and my other friends waited on the last bar on the end of the shoreline before the dark area starts. Me and my friend were talking about something when we just heard a gut-wrenching scream. It sounded like our friend, so we decided to rush in. The only light at that time is coming from the moon, so my friend decided to pull out his phone and turn on the flashlight. We asked around and saw some people hooking up on the sand. We asked if they saw our friend, giving them descriptions on what he might look like, but they said that they never saw him. Our hearts were pounding at this point because we don't know what might have happened to him. We ran until we reached the end of it. There was a huge rock on the shore about 15 feet tall with a local guy standing on the top of it. We asked him, have you seen our friend? He was about my height, wearing a black shirt, 
and he said, was he gay? I don't see the relevance of the question, but I said yes, and he said he might have gone over to the mangroves over there, and then pointed to a darker spot of the beach filled with mangroves. Using only the light on the phone, we tried searching the small area. It looks like a tiny shelter with overgrown plants acting as the roof. And when we turned back, the guy on the top of the rock is already walking towards us and then two more guys popped up behind him, probably hiding behind the huge rock as well. And then the guy who was on the rock did a karate chop on my friend's arm for him to let go of his phone, which was successful as the phone rolled onto the sand. My friend was able to grab the phone back and that's when he shouted, run. I was confused with what was going on, so I just started running after he said run without actually knowing what we were running from. And that was when it hit me that the whole thing was an ambush, that we were led into the mangroves for them to steal my friend's phone. I was running for a few seconds when I started feeling the weight on my feet. The sandals that I was wearing got really heavy because I wasn't aware that I was running on wet sand. My friend took off his flip-flops for him to run faster. I wanted to do the same, but then I realized my sandals were strap-on, so I just continued running. I can hear the guys chasing us, saying, stop, we're just joking. I don't want to fall for what they said, so I continued running and my legs are starting to feel numb since I'm not really an athletic person. And there came a point where I wanted to just stop since I don't have anything valuable with me, but... And then I thought that that could be a reason for them to harm me, so I just ran with all my might until we reached the first bar eventually. My friend was already there catching his breath when we saw the friend that we were looking for, laughing and talking to locals. We wanted to punch him for what he put us through, but he had no idea what had just happened, so we just let it go. Our vacation still went through, and we still got to go to the island from time to time, but we vowed to never go on that side of the beach ever again. In my old house, we not only had modern air conditioning vents, but we also had the original ones from 1922. The design was quite elaborate, though unfortunately I don't have any pictures of it. But anyways, one cool September day in 2015, I was sitting on the ground playing with my little brother, who had just turned one. We were in the hallway at the bottom of the staircase where one of the original air vents were. We were sitting right next to it. I was playing peekaboo with him. He was laughing and smiling and really happy, just having a grand old time basically playing with his awesome big sister. When I noticed a quiet hissing sound coming from the vent. It kind of sounded like parcel tongue from Harry Potter if I'm being honest, but I just thought that there was something wrong with the heater or something and I paid no mind to it. About five minutes after I had noticed the sound, it just suddenly stopped. I couldn't hear anything coming from it anymore, and the moment that I acknowledged that fact, my brother suddenly jumped, startled, and whipped his head around to face the vent. He had the look of just absolute fear on his face right before he just started shrieking and crying. I mean, it honestly sounded like someone had hit this kid, he was crying so hard. Because of the way Landon was crying, my stepmom ran in from the kitchen. She looked as worried as I'd ever seen her, and she said, Oh my goodness, what happened? Why is he crying like that? Did he hurt himself? I explained to her what happened. Talking to Landon, who is still wailing with fear, she says, It's okay. And then she says to me, well, What do you mean he just looked at the air vent and started crying? I said, I don't know. I don't know what he heard, but obviously whatever it was terrified him. She looked at me with honest confusion. She picked up my brother, still coddling him and swaying him as he cried and walking him outside, and he was fine after a minute or two, but he would never go near that vent without someone with him. Even in, even in 2017, after he turned three, he would still ask for people to walk with him past that vent. I never heard anything from that specific vent, though I did hear the same hissing throughout the house when I was home alone or with one of my siblings. But anyway... I hope you enjoyed this little short story, and thanks for listening. I'm a 30-year-old male and have dealt with strange encounters all my life, ranging from a basic kidnapping attempt to a haunting or demonic presence that felt like it would bring down an entire house on top of me. 
My wife and friends have always called me things like a magnet for trouble or a lightning rod for the weird, which is fair seeing as these kinds of people and situations do seem to be drawn to me and those who are close to me as well. I usually just listen to stories on YouTube, but I was goaded by my best friend into contributing some of my own experiences, and so I decided to start with one of my personal favorites. So around the ages of 18 and 19, I like to go camping and hiking every so often, and living in the northwestern US, it did nothing to put me off from doing so. In fact, I kind of found the cold and damp and dreariness calming in a weird sort of way. Spending a decent amount of time outdoors, I would occasionally meet some like-minded individuals, some of them Native American too. I grew up somewhat close with a small group of Native guys around my age, possibly three or four years older, and after running into them a few times, they took notice of how I was respectful of my surroundings, or at least that I was not an entitled glamper. I guess this gave them enough reason to invite me to join them on one of their outings over the weekend. Let's call them Wolf, Hawk, Bear, and Ted to make things a bit easier. So I met up with them at the edge of the forest before sunrise. We all shared the preference of getting an early start as well as getting as far from civilization as we could, within reason obviously. We hiked between 30 to 60 minutes before we found a decently wide flat area and set up camp. The remainder of the day was spent drinking lightly, sharing past experiences, identifying bird calls, and me listening to some of their cultural stories and legends. It was well after sunset, though, that the event occurred. So Wolf got up to answer the call of nature and wandered off through the trees. After he was out of sight, I decided that I might as well take care of my own burden, having hoped that I could wait till morning up until then. I made sure to let the rest of them know that I was going number two so they wouldn't worry if I was gone for longer than our other companion. I ventured out further than I would have had to have had I needed to leak, not wanting one of them to stumble upon me while in the middle of my business. I had just done my belt up and turned to return to our campsite when I thought that I heard something in the distance. I frowned, tilted my head and strained my ears to see if I could catch whatever it was again. Help! Someone cried out. It was soft, so I couldn't really tell exactly which direction it was coming from, but it sounded like a male's voice. Hello? I called back, eager to lend a hand to anyone who was lost or possibly injured. Help! The voice repeated, a little closer now. I took a few steps in the direction that I thought the voice might be coming from, sweeping my flashlight around the area. Are you lost? I shouted into the darkness. Lost? came the reply even closer than before. I found it a little strange that they responded with one word, but maybe I'd missed the rest or maybe they didn't know English very well. Either way, that was enough for me to take a few more quick determined steps towards the voice, but I was stopped dead in my tracks by the next thing that I heard. It said, I'm lost in a really shrieking voice, drawing out the word in what sounded like a human yelling mixed with the high-pitched scream of a deer or some sort of elk. I felt goosebumps raise wherever they could as I muttered to myself, what the hell was that? I took a couple of more slow steps, my flashlight darting from place to place until I heard twigs and brush being disturbed from the direction of our campsite. I whipped around while drawing my hunting knife to be met by the sight of Wolf wearing a stern but concerned expression. I relaxed and sighed in relief before trying to explain about the voice that I heard and how we should go out and see who or what is out there. He just grabbed my upper arm and stoically began dragging me back through the trees. I didn't resist, but I kept trying to make a case for at least attempting to rescue the person out in the woods. His response, though, was chilling. Yeah, I heard them too. and That ain't no person out there, man, he mumbled. I was too dumbstruck to say anything else until we got back to the rest of our group. Once within sight, they began clapping and hooting a little, raising their cans of beer as they shared a laugh. Wendigo almost got the white boy, did he? Bear asked. Wolf responded by shaking his head. His eyes widened as he exhaled with his cheeks slightly puffed up in a that-was-too-close kind of way. At this point, I'm sure it was one of their friends just helping them play a prank on me, so I called them out on it. They laughed a little more and Hawk said, Look around, man. We're all here. It was true that the four of them weren't really social with many others, but I was convinced that wasn't proof enough. But what happened next was... 
We had been talking about this for nearly half an hour, I'd say, before they just all froze, then sprung into action, dismantling and packing up camp faster than I'd ever seen, almost as if it were a sport and they were its star athletes. I tried asking what the hell was going on, but all I got was Hawk hissing, listen, not even slowing down in what he was doing. I stood still and tried to tune out all the rustling, thumping and clanking as best as I could. Eventually, my ears picked up on something though. It was a kind of deep chittering or clicking, similar to the sound the predator makes, coming from the same direction that I had gone to use the facilities. I was only standing there for a few seconds before I was snapped out of it by Bear, handing me a length of rope with a D-link on the end. Hook it onto your belt, can't afford to get separated, he said. His eyes focused on the brush past me. I took it and did as he said, following them to the side camp closest to the way back to our cars before they threw a couple of buckets of dirt over the fire. As soon as it was smothered, Wolf said that we needed to get out of the forest as fast as possible. We didn't run, being hooked together and all, but we walked quickly and half jogged the whole way, turning what had been about a 45 minute journey before into a 20 minute one. The mood seemed to lighten up immediately after we emerged from the forest, the rest of them laughing and catching their breath as if we had just come out of the other end of a perilous ordeal, me still feeling a little bit lost about what just happened. We set up camp again on the grass near our cars, no fire this time, just lanterns. Once we were all settled, I asked Wolf if they really thought Wendigos were real and if there had actually been one out there hunting me. They all went quiet as he explained. Well, you see, the truth is is that we don't know exactly what it is, he said with a shrug. All we know is that they use the voices of people or animals to lure their prey. And then, he clapped his hands. They ambush it. I felt a bit queasy, wondering how close I'd been to being attacked. A new thought came to mind. I get that it calls for help if it knows people are around, but what was that noise before we packed up? He looked back at me grimly. That's how they communicate with each other, man. I shuddered, further disturbed by the thought of more than one of those things stalking me. We spent the rest of the evening trying to recover what little good vibes were still to be had that weekend, talking about how we would circle around to a far part of the woods to ensure a good distance between us and those things. Unfortunately, our spirits were severely dampened by yet another cry from the woods. Why won't you help me? It screamed, jarring us all out of our mirth and forcing us all to lock eyes on the tree line. Huh, they followed you all the way here, man. Bear quipped before turning to look at me. I guess they have a taste for white meat, huh? He said with a grin. Don't worry, Wolf said quietly, gesturing to our surroundings. There's no cover here. They won't leave the forest. My eyes didn't leave the trees, though. You sure? I asked. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Wolf nod his head to the side slightly. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, he replied, a hint of doubt in his voice. And needless to say, I slept in my car that night. This happened the week before I went into my freshman year, so it was just a few years ago. I'm 18 now. So back when I was younger, I liked to sleep in the living room on the couch for some dumb reason. But next to the living room was our game room and my brother tended to sleep on the couch too. This night also happened to be a night when we didn't turn on the alarm, since our roommate came in and out so often during the night. And our big German shepherd was sleeping in my mum's room. It was pretty normal when everyone went to sleep. Until about 3am when I woke up to someone's hands wrapping around my throat. I couldn't see anything when I opened my eyes. Turns out he'd taken one of my newly cleaned towels and threw it over my face. And I couldn't really process what was going on. It's really hard to explain unless you've actually experienced it, but it was like I completely forgot that I could even speak as I flailed around trying to slip out of his grip. Even though my brother was sleeping mere feet away from me, the towel muffled my screaming. When I remembered that I could speak, I kind of reflexively just said, I'm sorry... But soon after I spoke, he let go and just ran out of the back door. After he left, I fell to the floor and just screamed until the rest of my family got up. I was confused because no one else was up. 
Like, he just left, even though no one could have caught him. I had no idea why he just up and left like that. He didn't even touch anything else in the house, in fact. But once the police showed up, they barely even believed us, since my brother couldn't even recall if he'd locked the door or not. It didn't help, too, that I lived in a pretty bad neighborhood and someone had even broken into our car just the week prior. We never really thought someone would break into a house, though, so we just weren't exactly on top of keeping our alarm on, but the back door that was opened happened to be the one that wasn't hooked up to the alarm anyway, which really made us think that it was someone that had been in the house before since they would have known that the door wasn't secured. That door was kind of always just broken, so we kept a couch pushed up against it and we didn't use it to go in and out after this. I don't really know where my roommate was, though, we didn't always talk and she was always in and out of god knows where anyway, probably at bars or sleeping at other people's houses. And yeah, we weren't very cautious of danger back then, but we certainly are these days. We always turn on our alarm now when we leave the house and at night too, and we have every door and window set up for the alarm as well. Plus, I've moved to a much better neighborhood now and haven't experienced any shady people around. So... He is hoping this doesn't happen again. I'm a Native American Indian and I have strong beliefs in the Creator and our medicine, which can also be used for ill intentions. When I was young, my grandmother had told me a story about how our family had bad medicine thrown on us, that someone cursed the males in our family. I didn't think back on this until more recent events. But looking back in retrospective, the males in my bloodline have either taken their lives, gotten murdered, or have extreme health problems. For example, my dad was killed when I was 11, my uncle when I was 23, and my grandpa when I was about 20. But this could be coincidence, I know, but let me explain. I have one uncle left out of our family, and he has kidney failure. When my grandma was helping him move, she found a bag of black stuff on the top of the fridge hidden in the back. She immediately disposed of it, and my uncle has been taunted quite a bit. Now, I've had a lot of experiences, but I'd like to share these particular incidences. So I live on the top suite of an apartment. This is unusual, but my partner and I were in bed when we heard our screen door slam shut. I was so sure that someone was in our apartment that I went to the kitchen and grabbed a knife, but nobody was there. Shortly after that, I woke up from a dream and I had this big long scratch on the side of my body. It was deep and a bit bloody, I even have a picture of it. And it was strange, but I smudged with my medicine, sage, cedar and sweetgrass and I felt a lot better after that. Now, fast forward a month or so, my partner and I are in the living room and heard this loud grunt by the screen door. She literally jumped up and we were like, what the hell was that? And about two nights after we'd heard that, she got a pounding headache. It was so bad, in fact, that Mike called the emergency line and the ambulance came. Except, these workers gave me a weird vibe as soon as they stepped into our home. He had no hair and his eyes were like huge headlights. He asked my partner some questions, like, is anything off lately? What's really going on? And I was thinking, what the hell is wrong with this guy? His vibe just really creeped us out. I wanted to tell him to leave, but I knew she wasn't feeling good. I was hoping to get some sort of help, but me eventually left, but not before he said, I'm from the motherland. And he was referring to Britain, and it was just really bizarre, but the whole conversation left us feeling just really uneasy. The next night, my partner is hospitalized because of the pain. We check out of the hospital after a few hours because the test came back clear, Note too that bad medicine can also affect your physical health, mental health, and it comes in different forms. The very next night though, we're laying in bed and my partner says she feels weird, like something is around. I reassured her everything was okay and we're laying there and she says, Babe, did my clothes or a blanket fall off the bed? And I said, What? No, I'm laying near the edge. She's like, Please check. I turn on the light and she screams and just starts crying. She said that she saw something black slide off the bed. And man, did I get shivers up my spine. I ran to our medicine shelf to get our medicine and I start smudging and praying at this point. 
I smudge our whole house and after that things have calmed down. No more disturbance for the rest of the night anyway. It's been a little while now since anything has bothered us but this is my first time sharing and piecing things together. I'm going to be seeing a traditional healer next week to have her cleanse us on our journey. I have a scar from the scratch that I woke up with the other night too and the whole situation is just really weird. Oh and uh, about the bad medicine too. From what I remember it was thrown on us because of jealousy or a dispute over land or something. I've heard with bad medicine that it can be removed from you though through prayer and traditional healers and hence why we're heading there soon. This happened a few years back, but it's still one of the oddest experiences that I've ever had. I still think about it from time to time, and it's pretty chilly. So, I was living in a house with four of my best friends. The house is laid out so that when you enter the front door, you walk down a short hallway that faces the communal bathroom, where the hallway tees off to the kitchen or living room on the left, and all the bedrooms to the right. Each stretch of the hall from the bathroom to the next room is roughly about 8 to 10 feet, I'd say. I just got off work too and came in through the front door and as I walked down the initial hallway saw my roommate, Jeff, standing at the sink and staring into the mirror. Thinking nothing of it, I said, hey Jeff, as I rounded the corner to the right to head to my room. After a beat or so and a few steps more, I hear, huh? Oh, hey dude. And I turned to see him and the odd thing was, Jeff was poking his head around the corner that led into the kitchen. I was puzzled because there was no way in those few steps that I had taken with my back to the bathroom that Jeff could have made it down the hall and around the corner unless he had literally ran full speed down there. I looked back at the bathroom and to him and asked, were you just in the bathroom? And he said no. As I let it sink in a bit, more in my confusion, I realized how odd the expression Jeff had in the bathroom, just blank and really eerie. To this day, I have no explanation for what happened. To further the discussion and the eeriness too, Jeff and I later had somewhat of a falling out. He seemed to almost become a different person in fact, changing from a polite, kind person to a very angry and bitter one. At the time, we thought that some distasteful people at his job were beginning to influence his lifestyle and behavior, him being a pretty impressionable follower. But now... I wonder if this phenomena didn't have some kind of an effect. Anyone have any thoughts or know more about doppelgangers? I sure would appreciate some insight. Thanks. This happened when I was 16. My stepdad has his uncle who, for as long as I can remember, I've just gotten really bad vibes from. It's hard to explain why too. It's kind of mostly just been instinctual. He's always just tried being playful toward all the little girls in our family, like tickling them and such, and I was always creeped out by it and have kept my interactions with him to the bare minimum ever since I was like eight, I'd say. Anyway, one day during the summer, I was sitting at my kitchen table with two other girlfriends and Mr. Creepy Uncle just walks right into my house. It wasn't abnormal for people to come and go as they pleased at my house during that time, but he was not someone who had ever just swung by and walked in before. He looks at my friends and me and asks, are your parents home? And I say no. Then he asks if we want some candy and I say nothing, but one of my friends, sweet summer child, says, I mean, yeah, I'd love some candy. He says, okay, but you have to come into my van to get it. Both me and my other friend basically say, hell no. And then he's like, are you sure? It's really good candy. He obviously refuse and after more probing, he basically is just like, okay, your loss. I told my mum and at the time she didn't have a huge deal about it. Probably because he's an idiot for thinking he could lure three 16 year old girls into his van with candy. But she is someone who has admitted to getting bad vibes from him too. But now that I'm an adult and have talked to her more about it, She's told me that that's basically the consensus in our family too. All of the women are creeped out by him and absolutely no one trusts him alone with their kids. She's also told me that he definitely has a record and has spent time in prison, but no one in the family will talk about why. 
I think maybe they're trying to protect him because he's just a lonely old bachelor and they figure that he's harmless. But what would he have done if we'd gotten in that van that day? I do not want to find out. My sister has a poltergeist that we all call George. It's questionable if he's actually a poltergeist or just a spirit or something else, who knows, but he's been around for at least 10 years now. Anyway, here's the stuff that you'll actually care about. So, like I said, his name is George and he kind of appeared when we built our new house. I assume, due to family issues that created a negative enough energy, he was created or was able to feed off of it enough to become more steady. I was the first one to notice him too. It started with the house creaking, lights flickering in my room, and glasses in the kitchen tinkering together at night. It's just the house settling, is what I told myself at first. It's just weird electrical issues, my dad told me. It's just your imagination, my mum told me. Yeah, okay, whatever. But then I started hearing actual footsteps at night, and cars door slamming outside at weird hours. It's just the house settling. It's people going to the bathroom or getting water. It's just the neighbors and the way the sound carries over the forest and fields. Again, bullcrap, but that's what I told myself. A few other experiences happened, not surrounding George, and slowly over time, more of my family started believing me. In fact, it kind of became a bit of a joke of sorts. Like, hey, where's my tape measure? I left it on the bar. George probably took it. And so, whenever we lost something and found it in a weird place, it was George. But there was one time that he took a biscuit, which I guess could have been a child, but it's more fun to blame the ghost, so like I said, it became a running joke. But then, it started getting more violent. For instance, if Dad was in a pissy mood, something would usually come flying at his head. Some of the more notable occurrences happened in the kitchen too when we would be cooking. Pots and pans and cookie sheets have all come out of their assigned areas and smacked him in the head. Which obviously makes him more angry, but he usually leaves the house for a bit when that happens. We always blame George, but he just blames whoever put the dishes up there for not putting them up correctly. Doors started slamming. It's just the air conditioner was the excuse, and furniture started moving around, just the dogs pushing stuff when they're not home, and glasses started shattering just for no reason, just chip thin glass, it happens. And while the parents brush it off as just normal occurrences and don't really think George is real, the kids, they know. And then came the big thing. So all the kids were in bed, but their closet light was on one night, we were all arguing on who was going to go and turn it off because nobody wanted to get up. And then we see a pale arm come out of the closet and flick the light switch off. Needless to say, we didn't sleep that night. For the longest time, I thought that he was attached to me because stuff always happened around me and I saw it the most. But after I moved out, I guess he attached himself to my little sister or something. So things have happened at both parents' houses, like the stuff I described, and some mild stuff at my mum's house too. House creaks, knocking, doorknobs rattling, windows banging, glasses breaking, weird electrical things and objects getting moved around. Always my sister's things too, and never my mum's, which is weird. My mum actually refuses to believe George is real, despite being present for many of the occurrences too. Over the years, George has become kind of a part of my sister's daily routine, in fact. She communicates with him pretty regularly, usually by knocks on the wall. She leaves some food on her plate when she gets done to kind of offer it to him. She has a small area in her room that she leaves open and clean for him. When he gets loud at night, she tells him to be quiet, and he listens. In fact, she rather enjoys his company most of the time. She says that she doesn't feel so alone. Now, I have no idea why we started calling him George, but that's just what he's always been to us. The pets that we have don't really react to him. They seem to be pretty chill with him. And yes, we've definitely had other experiences too, but we know George's patterns and the way he feels when he's doing things. Interestingly too, he only ever gets violent around people who are angry individuals, and seems to be more calm when around calmer individuals than my sister.
please note that although everything I've documented is factual, the case was never actually sold and has likely gone cold since this happened more than 10 years ago. So back in 2007, I found myself working as a bartender at a now closed pub in my hometown. Not a job I particularly liked, but it paid the bills. At this time, they hired a new kitchen manager, and his name was Kearney. But Kearney was a pleasant enough man, mostly keeping to himself, but always stayed late to help the barman do our closing duties, so we all liked him for that. New in town, Kearney had yet to find a place of permanent residence, and I had recently lost my tenant, so someone suggested that he ask me. He was considerably older than the tenants I usually took in, but having had a streak of bad luck with tenants my own age, I thought an older man with a nice steady job may be a shift in the right direction, so I agreed. Kearney wasted no time too, and followed me home that very same night, only he wasn't alone. Enter Lawrence, the boyfriend of Kearney. Honestly, I hadn't even realized that he was gay up at that point, but it was water off my back regardless back now, what really should have bothered me though was Lawrence's appearance. I don't mean this to sound horrible or anything, but he honestly looked like he'd been sleeping on the street. So Kearney moved in, Lawrence was there a lot too, and it was easy enough to know when due to his mobile ringtone sounding like the quacking of a duckling. Kearney had some habits too that were rather noteworthy to the story. In particular, one, he basically never closed his bedroom door, no matter what he was doing in there, it was always just open. And two, although he was a very heavy smoker, he never once smoked inside of the house. So Kenny had been living there for about two weeks, I'd say, when I had come down with an awful case of pink eye. This being highly contagious, I was given leave of absence from my bartending job and therefore decided to go wait it out at my sister's for a few days. And apparently I didn't mind giving it to her too. Sorry, sis. So the day my sister was scheduled to come pick me up, no, I couldn't drive yet, I took a casual stroll into the bar that myself and Ben, my good friend from high school, and at the time co-worker, had been building in my house, and something caught my eye. All of our liquor bottles were completely empty. Now, those who have been frequenting my house at that time would know that we weren't just talking about one or two bottles of brandy here too. But bottles of whiskey, gin, vodka, snaps, liqueurs. Basically, it was a fully stocked bar that could host a pretty big party without requiring much in the way of additions. So, I called Kearney in, asking him what he knew about this, receiving feedback that Lawrence and he had been on a slight drinking binge. Those were the actual words that he used. That he had left me both furious about the $1,000 worth of stock that they had drunk out also slightly impressed that he was actually still alive. Regardless though, I said that I'll be dealing with this upon my return. So I'm with my sister for a few days and on Friday, I get a call from the local police department asking me if I know a Conrad Schultz. Ironically enough, I didn't. And they finally add that I'll probably know him as Kearney and that I should probably come down to the station as they had just arrested his boyfriend trying to sell my camera equipment. So, my sister rushes me back to home, where all my camera equipment was on display at the police station. It's on this visit that I'm informed that Lawrence was actually a Navy SEAL who got dishonorably discharged before turning to a life of crime, and now had a rap sheet the length of the Bible. And the kicker was that both he and Kearney were actually homeless men who had met at the Salvation Army. So... Lawrence is in jail and my sister drops me off at home, more or less the same time that Kearney gets home as well. Based on Kearney's account of what had happened, he had turned Lawrence in himself as he couldn't allow Lawrence to do to me what he was trying to do. Although I had appreciated his sacrifice, I told Kearney that he would have to go, having been the overall cause of all of this. However, not wanting to leave the homeless man, well, homeless, I gave him until the end of the month to make other arrangements. So, Monday comes, and having just completed staff meetings, I walk home to encounter a very much free Lawrence, sitting on the sidewalk across my house, watching it. I confront Lawrence as to why he's there, and he tries to apologize before begging for money. Rather out of character, really, too, but I dismissed him without giving him a cent. Now, to go back to the previous night, 
You see, I had mentioned the staff meeting for a reason, as it was at this meeting where he had gotten a rather sizable list of liqueur bottles that had gone missing from the storeroom, leaving us all suspecting each other. But I, however, would not have to wait long to figure out who the real culprit was, as a few days later, I opened the garage bin in my kitchen to see the missing bottles, all empty and staring back straight at me. I decided to sit on this information for the time being, although I did photograph it, just for in case I needed as evidence later. I had also called over Ben to inform him of the other developments. As this was quickly becoming a detective game, we decided to enter Kearney's room to search for further evidence. Nothing of vast significance in there, with one exception. Two single photographs of Lawrence before he had turned into the homeless version of Lex Luthor or Charles Xavier. Actually, there were several of Lawrence's things still in there, but as Lawrence spent a lot of time in there, before the incident that is, I just accepted this as normal. Now, I should also add that I had mentioned Lawrence's release to Kearney and, and told him that if I even suspected that they were still seeing each other, I would throw him out of the house myself. Only a few days would pass before this came into play. On this particular night, I'd been bartending again, and Kearney had constantly been stopping by the bar to help himself to drought glasses, half full of wine and half full of coke, which he would go and drink outside the restaurant. We confronted him about this, but as he correctly pointed out, he was still a manager and we had no right to tell him what he could or could not do. On his fourth trip, however, I had grown suspicious and decided to follow him outside where I encountered Lawrence sitting outside sharing the half coke half wine concoctions with Kearney and this really ticked me off. So the next day I returned to the restaurant with my photographic evidence that I handed over to the general manager who was also kind of a friend of mine and although I hadn't physically seen it I had heard the confrontation through the office door when he fired Kearney. And Kearney left, obviously upset, and apparently had no idea that I'd been the one who had turned him in. So we had closed early that night, and I was walking home, going past the high school. I saw Kearney coming from the opposite direction. He just walked past me, literally only saying two words, I'm scared, before just disappearing into the darkness. And that would be the last time that... I would ever physically lay my eyes on Conrad Schultz. We reached the final week before Kearney's eviction was to take place. Ben had come to stay with me for that duration as we both wanted to monitor the situation and make sure that nothing else happens. It was in this week that Kearney's behavior suddenly changed. He was constantly smoking in his room and his door was closed 24-7. In fact, neither Ben nor I had caught so much as a peek from him in that entire last week which we hadn't thought much of at that time. So the day of Kearney's eviction comes around though, Ben had gone home for a few hours and I had finally heard Kearney's bedroom door open. Someone walks out of the room, opens the front door and leaves. I follow him outside but somehow he had already completely disappeared. Well, what was left though was his house keys, indicating that he obviously wasn't planning to come back. I took a look at the keys noticing something strange. Although the correct keys were all on the keychain, there were also several that weren't mine. And why would he leave me the wrong keys? I remember myself thinking as I walked into his room. And his room was a shock to say the least. Not because of the state that it was in. The two had broken his bed in an act of wild monkey stuff, but I had known about that already. As I said, he never closed the damn door but more that he had literally left almost all of his belongings behind, but with one exception. You guessed it too, the two photos of Lawrence. Upon further investigation, I suddenly realized too that all traces of Lawrence ever being there had completely vanished with all of Kearney's stuff left behind. There was one thing of Lawrence's left behind though, his duckling ringtone, which turned out hadn't been so much as a ringtone as an actual duckling which now strolled around casually in the vacant bedroom. We named him Neville, by the way. So, Ben returns and gets updated about the developments, both of us thinking the way that he left was rather weird. Of course, the whole thing had been weird, though. It was only when I asked the infamous question that this 
became a bit of a conspiracy theory. Did you ever actually see Kearney in this last week? It was to our shock that we realized that neither of us had. And suddenly putting the puzzle pieces together, the changing habits, Neville the Duck, the wrong keys, only Lawrence's stuff being gone, it was to great discomfort that we both asked the question, who had been really living in our house this last week? During the next few days, Ben and I went on a bit of a mission, searching the town, crawling into drain pipes, trying to find any trace of Kearney's whereabouts. But they all added up to nothing. Conrad Schultz had simply vanished off the face of the earth. That wasn't the case with Lawrence, though. No, he was still around, having made some new homeless friends, and we encountered him several times begging on the streets. I asked him every time, where's Kearney, Lawrence? But he just acted like he had never even heard of him. Last time that I would see Lawrence was across from my work, attempting to break into a car. I had called the police on him and they had arrived rather quickly, arresting him on the spot. And while he was being led away by the police, I shouted after him one more time, where is Kearney Lawrence? But he just ignored me and let the cops drag him away. The next day I filed a police report, reporting Kearney as a missing person and suggested that Lawrence may know something about it. But ever really came of it. When I was about four, my parents and I moved into a new house in a really awesome neighborhood. Everything was going pretty great. And then one night, my dad woke up to heavy knocking on our front door at 3am. He went to see what was going on and there were multiple police cars and a bunch of policemen standing around our house. My dad opened the door and asked the officers what was wrong. One of them said, Sir, I need you to bring your wife and child, if you have one, downstairs. Then I need you to step outside with these officers here. My dad has no idea what in the world was happening, but he went upstairs and woke up my mum and I. When he brought us down, the officers sat my mum and me on the couch and started asking super weird questions. It was all stuff like, does your husband ever hurt you? Has he ever made you feel helpless? Have you ever gone in your basement to get away from him? Does he ever lay hands on you or your child? All stuff like that. My mum was obviously shocked and, of course, said no to all of it. My dad would never do anything like that. Then, policemen with flashlights and guns came in and asked to search our house. We said yes because we were honestly freaked out at this point and no one was telling us what was going on. They walked all around our house and then asked to see our basement. Now, our basement is not finished, but it was very large and super creepy. I hated it so much at the time too. No one ever goes down there and we just keep it locked. My dad unlocked it and they searched it and were calling out stuff like, we're here to help, please come out. They couldn't find anything of interest, so they came back upstairs. My dad then told them that we deserved to know what was going on. One of them said, nothing seems to be the matter here, so I guess it's fine to tell you. We received a call from a woman who was hysterical. She was screaming and crying, saying that her husband was going to kill her. She had barricaded herself in a basement to get away from him. My dad was obviously spooked and said, well, why would you come to our house? And the officer said, we traced the call to your house. And that is why I hate my basement so much more than I already did. Our neighborhood is very old and so is our house, so maybe it was a ghost or something. We still don't know what happened that night, neither do the police, but I do know that sometimes weird stuff happens in my basement. It has a door to the outside that we keep locked, but I've been outside and seen it swing open at one stage. We even use like deadbolts and stuff too. So anyway, we still don't know what happened, but it was weird. This happened when I was a small child, probably around four, and it was an experience that I know now as a near-death experience. So I was with my grandmother, who was very healthy, still is very healthy for a 70-year-old woman. We went trekking across our property with a picnic basket in tow, just looking to sit down with our dog and have a nice time, normal grandparent stuff. 
before we ended up crossing the creek, it was dry at the time, to go back to the pasture. Nearby, probably uh, 50 yards away, was our cedar tree. We had sat down and started eating when our dog just started acting crazy. This dog, bless her soul, was an angel too. Honestly, did not act like a dog most of the time. She never barked, never jumped, always acted polite. But at this stage, she just went nuts, running in circles around us, growling and barking. My grandmother got concerned, obviously, so she put our picnic stuff in the basket and tried to calm her down. I was sitting a few feet away, scared because my dog was growling. I'll admit too that my memory gets a little bit fuzzy around here, but I remember seeing a large grey creature step out of the creek or the tree line that we had previously walked through. My grandma scooped me up and just booked it out of there, our dog running with us. I am 90% sure too that she ran to the cedar tree and she always talked about it being her favourite tree and about how protective it was or something. The tree was a lot closer than her house and that was roughly half a mile away at this point. I just remember our dog calmed down eventually and I was happier. And no, I don't live in the southwest. I live in the south central and east in Arkansas, close to Louisiana. So I honestly have no idea what it could be. <laughs>